are you in recession or are you not in recession? And we have a very low probability of recession this year. We are not out of the woods when it comes to battling inflation. The pain trade is that everybody thinks that inflation is fully vanquished. Either inflation falls because the economy continues to weaken or the economy stays strong. What we need to focus on is what's happening with the data and what we need to understand from the Fed is, is it only inflation or are they taking into account a slightly softer economy? This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow and Lisa Abramowitz. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio alongside Tom <coughs> Keane and Lisa Browitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Your equity market slightly positive on the S&P by 0.1% after a soft start to 2024. TK three-day losing streak on the S&P. Make it day four for the Nasdaq. Tangible, but not, you know, still not to support yet, John. I, I think there's a lot of different opinions here. There's a lot of people out there that were more cautious in the market saying, see, this is what you get after that bang up fourth at quarter. What I'd say is we're starving for a narrative. And to me, what Thursday is, it's adjust the narrative Thursday and Friday. We're going to feel a lot different at 831 tomorrow. The economic data taking shape over the next 24 hours. Jobless claims coming up a little bit later. Payrolls coming up tomorrow. Fed minutes yesterday afternoon. Not much for the equity bulls to get their hands yeah. around. At least some of the commentary coming from Morgan Stanley. Not cutting any time soon from Jeffries. Attempting to put the toothpaste back into the tube. And completely failing. Let's be completely honest. They did not succeed in really sending any kind of hawkish message. Maybe on the margins they're saying, yeah, optionality, words, words, words. But at the same time, uh, really to me what this highlights is that they really stand behind the message Sent, but this stood out. Many participants remarked that an easing in financial conditions beyond what is appropriate could make it more difficult for the okay. committee to reach its inflation goals. Suddenly, they're worried about uh, financial conditions again. You beat me up so badly yesterday. I actually looked at the minutes. There were 425 people in the room. A lot of Zoom call there, I'm sure. Did it move the market? I tried to f discover when the minutes were released, did it mean anything to equities, bonds, currencies, commodities. Should we feel guilty that we forced you to read the minutes? Is that basically what you're trying to say? I didn't read the minutes. I read who was there. <laughs> okay, it's great. Like a, okay. It's like when there's but a state dinner. At, page seven no, it's, it's, like, it's like a state dinner at the White House. Right. Do you look at the menu or do you see who's there? It doesn't move the needle in any kind of material way. But it does highlight this point that the, uh, the uncertainty is there that the Fed officials want to push back and financial conditions matter again. Did it move the needle? No, not Let's at all. Let's talk about a single name, Bramo. <coughs> Let's talk about Apple in the pre-market. Another downgrade for Apple. This time from Harsh Kumar of Piper Sandler, downgrading the stock to neutral from overweight. We're down 0.8% in the pre-market. They say valuation concerns and broader handset and macro weakness in the first half of 2024. Now, Lisa, what's important <coughs> about this, if you plot the calls from Harsh Kumar, over at Piper Sandler, they've had a buy on this stock since spring of 2020. And that was when this name traded in the 60s. Now we're at 182. It's quite a move from someone who was an Apple bull. The pile on continues, and this comes after four straight days of declines for the Nasdaq 100, uh, which is the longest losing streak going back two months. Here's the question. Is Apple its own story, or is it going to drag down the rest of the tech complex? We've been talking about the dispersion within tech that we're expecting, and yet you have seen right. a real uh, <clears throat> moving in tandem in that sphere. I'm saying people are in support or resistance. Apple is not. It's a tangible five. 5.6 standard deviation move from the peak that we saw about December 13th on down. And John, we are down 3.2 standard deviations in Apple. That is truly tangible. I keep doing this. We have to frame it with last year's price action. So yes, we have pulled back, but we still had a gain of almost 50% in 2023 for that single name. Let's get to the price action more broadly. The scores look like this on the S&P 500, positive by 0.1% on the S&P. Yields up again by three or four basis points. 395.35, getting closer and closer, Lisa, to 4%. Yeah, but not reaching it as it's really kind of quiet in the yield space. This morning, we're looking at data out of Europe as well as the drumbeat to the jobs report tomorrow. We get German December CPI at 8 a.m. Eastern. This comes ahead of uh, European CPI data that's more broad 
abroad tomorrow. Here's the question. What is the threshold to really uh, stymie the rally that we have seen in 10-year bonds with yields coming in materially from the recent high? We've been on a round trip. We do see some sort of disinflation continuing in Europe. Today, ADP comes out. The employment change for December at 8.15. Always, no one cares until they do. 8.30 a.m., initial jobless claims. Yesterday's jolts data was interesting, and not because of the headline number, but because of the so-called quits rate, which ticked down to the lowest in September 2020. I am watching indicators like this to, to sort of key off whether we really are seeing a softening. And at 9.30 a.m., the S&P Global U.S. Services PMI may be more instructive than manufacturing, which remained in contraction for, what, the 19th month straight? And Something nobody cared? Like that. End of 2020, late 2022, late 2022. It's been in negative territory, sub-50. And somehow the commentary around it was positive because it's sort of improving. My point is that it really has been sort of a non-issue, even though traditionally it has been. Services really is what you need to be watching. I'm pleased you brought up jolts because I'm with you. There is a difference, and you can decide where that line is, between a welcome calling in the labor market and an unwelcome deterioration. I think it speaks to that data just yesterday. Here's the thing. At, at an inflection point, it's hard to know whether this is the beginning of a dramatic swoon in the labor market or whether this is just the gradual softening that's needed to bring inflation down. That's the uncertainty that's causing a lack of narrative. And that's really what I'm trying to get my head around. I, I, I got a yield call of 3% and 10 minutes later got a yield call of 5.5%. I think we're all looking around for a narrative and, you know, you make your bet and you're in play. A lot of the people are in play in the markets and the doom, the doom clue, the crew has had a hell of a 48 hours. I mean, they, did you see what they did to Dan Ives yesterday? Versus a pretty brutal I think Dan Ives is wearing them. black all day. I mean, he's got, you know, the black Air Jordans well, morning, on. the losses in Apple. No, yeah. he's got pounded the yesterday. Last couple of days. The Doesn't bears went black. after him on Apple. I think it was he has harsh. any black. I don't know. I doubt it. <laughs> I don't think he has I any black I doubt in his wardrobe. It. No reason to after the games we saw last year. Let's kick off the conversation this morning. Ben Gutteris joins us now, investment director at Invesco Investment Solutions. Ben, this line from you, recessionary risks are material for 2024 as prior rate hikes bite. Is that just last year's outlook reheated or is there something different about 2024? Um, <clears throat> well, uh, hello to everyone. Uh, Happy New Year. That, uh, that comment still holds. I mean, it, the context of it is one of a, a positive view on equities and the, the economy. Um, but like the risk to that view um, is, well, one of the risks is the recessionary threat. Um, I think the conditions uh, are, are in play for continued, you know, uh, recovering gains in equity markets, a resilient growth, fading inflationary pressure, accommodative policy, or incrementally more accommodative policy, and that, that feeds our positive view on equities. But yeah, I mean, yeah. you know, pe- uh, businesses, consumers, it's not all about mortgages, you know, overdrafts, credit cards, uh, auto loans, uh, that they're going to roll into new, more punishing rates. And so, you know, that could right. yet bite and will bite harder into uh, consumer confidence. Uh, ben, on an allocation basis, and let's base it off a standard market with 60-40 basis, what is 60-40 going to do this year? I mean, is there in play there? Can bonds actually give me more than a coupon? Well, I, I think a 60-40 portfolio is a, is a really has a, has a, is a, is a compelling place to start, um, certainly relative to, to, to prior years. You know, that disinflationary narrative that I sort of talked about, of course, doesn't just support uh, equities. It, di- it directly supports uh, bonds uh, uh, as well. And certainly, as we refer to the previous answer and talk about one of the risks to uh, the equity market is a recessionary threat. Well, of course, um, provided you have lots of high quality bonds in there and certainly uh, just some duration and some government bonds, that 40 should do materially better than it has done in, in, in prior years. So, you know, I think it's a good place to start. Certainly some uh, uh, adjustments needs to be made within the 60, within the 40, but uh, not, not a bad right. place to begin. Well, the, the adjustments that are going to be made, are they going to be made off economics or are they going to be made off traditional securities analysis on revenue growth guesstimates and earnings guesstimates? I mean, the media loves to play the Fed game, but is it germane this year? Well, I think that, that the that the Fed game will continue to um, create noise and, and uncertainty in markets, but it, it will be the data that uh, that ultimately drives markets. And if that disinflationary narrative, you know, holds and growth remains resilient, uh, and the Fed can cut a couple of times, then markets 
you know, I know November and December is, will have delivered a lot of the gains on the back of that nar- narrative, but um, uh, the, the, the gains, it should be st- still be a positive environment for equities uh, in, that, uh, in, in that outcome. You know, you talk about 60-40, and I'm glad that Tom brought this up, and you said it's a good place to start. Yesterday, we heard something similar from Phil Camparelli, who said we can finally play defense again with bonds. And yet, Bespoke Investment uh, came out yesterday with this chart showing that bonds and stocks have moved in the most positively correlated manner, going back to 1998. This has continued, regardless of some people's calls, that 60-40 can be resurgent. How concerned are you about that, that this, the relationship has been irrevocably broken? Well, look, I think it, that, that there are risks to our investment strategy and to a 60-40. The most perilous would be a return of the conditions that we saw in 2022, heaven forbid, and that would be a reflationary, um, uh, an inflationary resurgence um, because, of course, that's damaging to both bonds as interest rate hikes are back on the table. And then you're thinking about a more material recession as well because we're starting from such a high level on rates. So, yeah, I mean, the thing that uh, gives me the most anxiety is, is perhaps a, a cut that comes too soon from central banks. And, uh, and, and given labour market conditions where they are, uh, m- maybe that injects too much confidence. And as I say, inflation back on the table, uh, rate hikes a possibility again. So that's the thing that worries me the most for a 60-40 uh, rather than a recessionary threat. Clearly, it's not as hard, hard to envisage 60-40 is going to be making much money in and around uh, the onset of a recession. Uh, but it would be reflationary uh, pressures returning that uh, would, would cause us the most trouble. Ben, uh, before we let you go, I am curious how you treat some of the geopolitical news that we've been getting every morning because some of the headlines have been increasingly inflammatory. How much can you trade off of some of these rising concerns about a broadening in the conflict in the Middle East? Well, well that, that, that is a very, a very difficult question to answer. I don't want to appear reckless to it, but it, uh, you know, the, the geopolitical challenges, you know, if you anchor your investment strategy to geopolitical challenges, that can be a touch reckless uh, too, because they're very difficult to predict. And at the moment, you know, it's, it's very terrifying news, but I th- it, it looks as though things are being contained. Markets are, are, are relatively sanguine uh, to it, but it's important to have a hedge in place. And, and of course, the, the key risk is that you get uh, the oil price surging back, and uh, that would be reflationary, bad news for 6040. But maybe some parts of the, the capital markets can, can perform a little better, you know, going long break-evens, going long energy stocks, going long UK equities. We think that's a decent hedge against a resurgence uh, in, in, in inflation in, in the oil price. But we, we wouldn't anchor investment strategy to geo, geopolitics, uh, but certainly put some hedges in place as, as a consequence of it. Energy stocks outperforming in yesterday's session. Ben, thanks for that. Happy New Year, sir. Ben Gunridge there you. of Invesco <coughs> Investment Solutions. Crude, biggest one-day gain going back to, I think, the middle yeah. of November. Adding to some of those gains this morning, Lisa, up by almost 1% on WTI, $73 and about 40 cents. And this comes after some pretty fiery rhetoric out of Iran after the uh, attacks during the funeral, during the commemoration of their top commander from three years ago, four years ago. What I'm looking at right now is whether there is this knee-jerk response to any escalation in oil, whether it can stick since it hasn't so far. Well, it hasn't so far, but look where we are. We were going to 90, what, 24 months ago, we were modeling in 110, 120, Pacific Rim demand, et cetera, and we're still awaiting that. Now, maybe we see it this year. Oil, to me, is the single toughest thing to call, John. I think there's some pretty good academic research That's on that. That's always the way. But, but the answer is, you know, I haven't, I haven't looked at the fancy charts, but the answer is oil's been a gift. I'm seeing across America a lot of under $3 a gallon. You know, I mean, that's, John, it's not in liters, excuse me. At least well, translate worry. the liters. This goes back to the you number to we Chicago, repeat every single morning. 13.3 million yeah. barrels a day of crude production in this country. That helps. My academic research, my conclusion, Tom, on all of that, if you want to make a fool out of someone, ask them for their year-end crude forecast. Usually the way of doing it. Yeah. It's tremendously yeah. difficult to do. Other question. It's a British question. Sure. It's a European question. Can I fit in the little cute Fiat? One drove by me. The Fiat Avenue. 500. Yeah. One, is it like... Is like the smart car him? where you can fit it in? I'm going to say no based on the fact that you get annoyed about Chevy Suburbans. I do, yeah. <laughs> well, you know. So it's I'm, a cute I'm car. going to say no based yeah. on that. From New York City All this morning. Petrol. Good morning.
The jobs report last month beat estimates. That is a stunning number. That is what nobody was expecting. The bullish train has left the station. This is what Powell does not want to see. This Friday, Tom, Jonathan, Lisa, and Mike will bring you crucial data and expert analysis at terminal speed. You're really not seeing the level of restrictiveness show up yet in the labor market. Significant job growth and high labor force participation. There's a very strong chance that the market is mispriced for 2024. The December jobs report, Friday on Bloomberg Television and Radio. We have no indication at this time at all that Israel was involved in any way whatsoever. Everything that we've done, in fact, the laydown I just offered of the force posture changes that the president has ordered in the region has been designed to prevent an escalation or widening or deepening of this conflict. Um, as we've said before, we don't want to see it widen beyond Israel and Hamas. And again, we're going to keep working with partners in the region to prevent that from happening. That was John Kirby, the U.S. National Security Council spokesman, addressing the recent blast that took place in Iran, killing at least 84 people as fears of a larger Middle East conflict continue to escalate. Ed Mills of Raymond James coming up very shortly. Stay tuned for that. I just want to touch base with a price action for you. For those just tuning in in the equity market on the S&P 500, slightly firmer after a three-day losing streak on the S&P, four days on the Nasdaq 100. We are higher this morning by 0.15% on the S&P 500. In the bond market, yields higher by almost four basis points. The 10-year, 395.54. The next stop for the economic data, a little bit later this morning, 8.30 Eastern Time, initial jobless claims, 8.15 the ADP report, the appetizer for the big one, the <coughs> payrolls report just around the corner, the estimate at the moment 171 thousand all of that still to come just to finish on crew tk things are starting to pick up yesterday yeah. again today up by another one percentage point just a grind higher in the last 24 hours 73 43. the bloomberg professional service as it's called has green on the screen today it looks a little december-ish if you will versus the two days of carnage we've seen uh, in january john to that jobs report on friday i looked at oh i think 15 survey points and everything's just marginally shifted. It's just a sort of nuanced guesstimate of what we're going to see tomorrow. Things have cooled in the last 12 months, but <coughs> let's go through some numbers together. Claims today, 216 is the estimate. Payrolls tomorrow, 171 is the estimate. The unemployment rate may be coming in a little bit higher at 3.8%. Wage growth, year over year, something <coughs> around four. It yeah. doesn't scream end a cycle. Does it? Yeah, no, Those it kind doesn't. Of numbers. And, and, you know, some people are looking for some drama about I, to the, what you just mentioned, John. I would go to wage growth in four percent. Is it going to get it done for Jerome Powell? Speaking of incremental, there's incremental action in Washington. They're maybe coming back to work. Edward Mills joins us. Ed Mills, Washington policy analyst at Raymond James. Ed, you've got a very domestic note today with domestic issues. John Farrell mentions uh, the idea of our foreign wars. Is there a foreign policy stance among Republicans and Democrats on Capitol Hill? Uh, Tom, they're trying to find that, and I think that they do wrap it from a domestic agenda. Uh, what we're looking at for a January agenda is not just funding the United States government, but it's the national security issues. And so you have the supplemental looming in the background for Israel, for Ukraine, for Taiwan. But Republicans are saying if we're talking about national security, we also have to talk about the border. So that's why Republicans were at the southern border uh, yesterday, right. pushing for those border protections. But the problem for them is that they continue to lose members and they're down to 219. Usually you need 218 to get something through the House. So they have really strong border policies. Right. But right now they don't have the votes. What is the Democrat Party view on a national security issue at the border. Do they agree? Is it a nuance? Do they flat out disagree with Speaker Johnson? So I think it's a little bit nuanced. Uh, in the bill that failed in the Senate in December, there were some border funding provisions. Uh, what we have right now is that Democrats uh, understand that they need to do more on the border. There's been negotiations, but they certainly don't want to go as far as House Republicans have been pushing for. Uh, they call it H.R. 2, the Protect the Border Act. Uh, that's real changes to asylum. Uh, that's changes to kind of E-verify systems in the United States. That's rebuilding the Trump border wall. Uh, those are a step too far for Democrats. What I think we have to see is that Democrats have to go further than they're comfortable with to get the other provisions 
but we are in that period of trying to figure out exactly where that line is. And so we're going to go right up to it and potentially have a government shutdown come January 19th or February 2nd, the two funding deadlines that are approaching very quickly here. That's where I wanted to go, Ed. There seems to be a sort of a subtle shift in the Republican Party moving away from just tying some of the border uh, kinds of security provisions to funding for Ukraine and Israel, to moving it more broadly, to shutting down the government if they don't get what they want. Does that make it so much more likely that we are going to get a government shutdown? It doesn't even matter. It, it's a great question, Lisa. And I think that we're kind of right on that precipice of either grand bargain or bust because um, we probably have to watch what develops in the Senate, uh, but you do have this sense that Republicans want to fight, that they want to show that they are pushing for border security and want to push for more than what Democrats want. And sometimes by having that shutdown really elevates their point. However, Republicans also want to have the ability to say they got something done, that when they run for reelection here in November, that they can point to an accomplishment. And so that's where the grand bargain comes in. There is still a strong desire in DC to support Israel, Ukraine, Taiwan through a defense supplemental. And if you can put that all together, and we have to remember that even if we shut down the government, at some point we're gonna reopen it. So it's just a question of how far and how much drama there is. But at Raymond James, we always do point out that in past government shutdowns, the on average, the S&P 500 has been up by 3.2%. So from a market perspective, um, we kind of tend to discount the fact that the government could shut down because it always <clears throat> reopens. Talking about drama, Donald Trump, we're talking about January 15th. We've got the Iowa caucuses. Then we've got New Hampshire on January 23rd, where we have the first primary in the country. How much does it change the calculus if Donald Trump, as expected, wins the primary races uh, in those two states? And we do get the sort of feeling that he, once again, is at the helm very much of the Republican Party. So, Lisa, I think at that point, what you would see is that the voice of Donald Trump becomes even more important uh, in congressional fights. Right now, a lot of the times when he uh, sends out a message or, or sets a policy stance, uh, it, it's, it's noticed in D.C., but it's not truly followed. If he reestablishes himself as the head or the de facto head of the Republican Party uh, and looks like it's going to be the nominee, then if he comes out and says, kill this bill, don't vote for this, you have to fight stronger on border security, that makes it much harder for Republicans to cut the deal. Um, and so that's putting pressure to try to do it sooner rather than later. If they can get it done by that January 19th deadline, that is after the Iowa caucuses, but before that momentum could build. Alternatively, if you have someone like a Nikki Haley emerge, I think the markets would start to kind of surge because there is a sense that she is a stronger candidate against Biden, the likely Democratic nominee, uh, and, and it gives a little bit more wiggle room uh, for House Republicans and House uh, or Republicans generally in D.C. to potentially cut that deal. That's the range of outcomes, Ed. You've got to tell me your base case for the next month. What are things yeah, look no, like? The, the, yeah, the base case is drama, brinkmanship. It does seem like we could easily get that government shut down. Um, but from a market perspective, yeah, I tell clients to kind of pay attention to that longer term uh, provision. I do think we will get government funded. We will get a defense supplemental. We will get something on the border. It's just a question of timing, John. Ed, thank you, buddy. Good to catch up. Happy thank New you. Year, sir. Ed Mills there of Raymond James. What a calendar. What a political calendar. Never mind the rest of the year. <clears throat> the next month, at least the next four weeks, we've got January 19th, then February 2nd, and a ton <laughs> of dates in between. My favorite part is you asked him, OK, so you've got all of these potential outcomes and potential market moving things. What's your base case? And he's like, I don't know. Maybe it's just like things are going <laughs> to be a long tough. Term view. Yeah, exactly. I mean, this is the reason why it's like, what, staring at the sun? Is that what you said yesterday? That's what Laurie Cowan Vecina of RBC said about talking presidential elections at the moment. I mean, that seems to be everything when you talk about government shutdowns. OK, let's say we get a government shutdown. Does it matter? People will say yes until it happens. And then they'll say, yeah, it never matters. I mean, these are the kinds of things that we keep thinking about as we deal with some pretty massive dates and some pretty massive decisions. It's okay, two key deadlines coming up. You know, the key deadlines are there, but what's really important, Lisa, can you imagine John up to Freeport, Maine, get the L.L. Bean Act going? 
down Route 95. Do you know that I get so many L.L. Bean catalogs just because of you? You've mentioned Your this. Your listening to you. I mean, seriously. Yeah. That's what's happening. That's what Jen, happens. I can you see mentioned it? Thing. Can you see Farrell at the New that. Hampshire primary? You're determined Bean to send me that, yeah. I've, I've noticed that. He could get the wicker basket, you know, you walk around too. with a wicker he just basket. Wants to, you know, mm. see you decked out. Three-day losing streak on the S&P 500. Four-day losing streak on the Nasdaq 100 coming into Thursday. The price action this morning looks like this. Good morning to you all. Trying to bounce by 0.2% on the S&P, up by 0.2% on the Nasdaq. The small caps, the Russell, up by 0.7%. One single name to take a look at in the pre-market. Once again, it's Apple. And it's another downgrade, this time from Harsh Kumar over at Piper Sandler. The stock is down by just 0.6% after a struggle to start 2024. Lisa, the takeaway, the headline from them, valuation concerns and broader handset and macro weakness in the first half of this year. The problem is that everybody's known this, right? They point to the same things that we heard from Barclays that everybody does seem to know, and yet still it's making an impact on the shares because people seem to be more concerned about valuations getting ahead of themselves, <laughs> and Apple is the poster child for that. Weakness, Tom. Just not had yeah. the growth in iPhone sales against the multiple that's continued to expand, which is why Barclays pushed back early on to start this year. Uh, Mid-December uh, Nirvana near $200 per share. Let's call it down 8% right now. And as I mentioned earlier, on a standard deviation basis, this let's be clear, this is worse than the general NASDAQ Magnificent 7 failure that we've seen. Should we turn to the bond market? Two-year, 10-year, <coughs> 30-year in Treasuries. Looking a little something like this on a two-year. We're at 434. Yields up a single basis point on a 10-year, 395.35. And tons of data out later. Lisa, we talked about how the ISM manufacturing has just been useless as a gauge for the broader economy. It's been sub-50 since late 2022. <coughs> Jobless claims. One of the data points over the last year that just spoke to that resilience, that strength, still in and around 200K. And people point to the fact that, okay, it creeps up to 216,000, things are going to fall out of bed. But here's the thing. Are we reaching an inflection point? Are we just seeing a gradual normalization of a market that's been incredibly hot? And that, I think, is some of the uh, uncertainty that people are trying to grapple with and certainly what you're feeling in the market. The claims data two hours away. I want to turn to foreign exchange just briefly. We can talk about the euro against the dollar. We can talk about the euro against the Swissy as well, T if you wish. The euro is a little stronger against the dollar at 109.56. <coughs> the Swissy yeah. in the last month or so taking out, Tom, some really interesting levels. Yeah, it, it can be domestic in an oddity of Europe where you look at Swiss against Hungarian foreign because so many mortgages in Hungary are based off Swiss franc. Okay, that's an inside the baseball thing. But outside this, Swiss franc are downs on everything out there, including EM. And we've burst through to new strength. A lot of technical analysis can be done on this. There's some, you know, scuttlebutt. Oh, they own so much Apple shares within S&B. Maybe it's sure. they're selling it into the weakness, whatever. <laughs> You're going to start that rumor, huh? <laughs> no, no, the rumor's out there. But, you know, there's a lot Is of speculation. <laughs> John and I lived this in Zurich years ago. We were at uh, Brasserie Lee. Should we do story uh, time? Yeah, you oh, know. Well, that's what we're doing. We were there having a $200 lunch. And, you know. And I mean, well, back then it was 200 now it would be $300 lunch, and SMB acted with a vengeance. Will they act with a vengeance this time? Let's do a 12, 13-year history <clears throat> of Euro-Swiss, shall we? If we can just quickly in the control room get a chart of Euro-Swiss up and take it back to 2011. So in 2011, Eurozone debt crisis, Swiss is getting stronger, stronger, stronger against the Euro. It's a problem. Philip Hildebrand's leading the SMB. It's late August, early September. Yeah. The SMB introduces a floor for Euro Swiss of 120. Philip Hildebrand gets in a bit of trouble. We won't talk about that. Early 2012, Thomas Jordan takes over, keeps that floor until early 2015, which is when you and I were covering that story right. over yeah. in Switzerland. Rips away the Euro Swiss floor of 120. The Swiss he absolutely surges. And Tom, we trade in the 90s on Euro Swiss. And I can tell you that in the last month, Euro Swiss has taken out the levels that we dropped to when we ripped right. away that floor in early 2015. TK, that's how strong the Swiss yeah, is right now relative to where we've been. The, the strength here does, it goes into the Swiss economy, but far more, this is not like China where there's a measured, there's a gradualism in that. When they act, it's with a vengeance. I don't hear that speculation now, John, but nevertheless, that's the history from SNB. Euro Swiss back in the 90s, and we don't know how many 
foreign stocks they're buying at the moment, Tom, so we won't comment on that. <coughs> Under surveillance this morning, tensions building in the Middle East after nearly 100 Stop. people were killed in a blast in Iran. Two explosions targeted a crowd, marking the death of a top general killed by a US drone strike in early 2020. No group is taking responsibility for the blast. The US State Department saying it is no reason, Lisa, to believe Israel was involved. This has been one of the most confusing stories. The more that I read about it, the more uncertainty there seems to feel, because right now, US administration officials uh, say anonymously that they don't think that Israel did it, that usually they act in a different way. Meanwhile, you've got Iran blaming Israel, blaming the U.S., some people saying maybe it's ISIS. There's all this speculation, but really it's unclear what even the motivation really is, because it is a different kind of attack. It is not targeted to one official. It is general pu public in Iran, and there is some Iranian anger right now from the pub population to the leader saying, why didn't you protect us at this yeah. major event? On the anniversary time of Soleimani's execution, assassination, yeah, the, going back three, four years, which is remarkable to think about. I just remember that January of 2020 when it just felt like we're on the brink of something big and it wasn't a pandemic. It was this. Yeah, I, I think Lisa gave a nice overview of it there of Sunni and Shia and all the other niceties of religion and government as well. But it clearly rocked Iranian society on a Thursday. I want to turn to this that. story as well, TK, just moving it over to Japan. Nomura boosting pay for young brokerage staffers by 16% in its next fiscal year. The Japanese firm boosting salaries far higher than local inflation amid competition for talent. This marks the first increase for young staffers going back to 2017. TK, we're talking about a once-in-a-generation opportunity to reset inflation expectations in Japan and drive well, wage growth. Are we starting to see signs of it? Get out the calendar. This is really well-timed as it's bonai season here in New York as well. And the, 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 the canard here the CEOs come out, you know, they like to come out on Bloomberg. They talk to Shanali Basak. We're going to be responsible and measured and cost control. Baloney. they got to keep the talent. That's all there is to it. You want to talk they about cost control? Talent. This is a perfect <clears throat> story then. Yeah. China, totally different story. Banks in China telling staff to cut travel costs. The moves include booking cheaper hotel rooms. And guess what? Drum roll, TK. Lisa, they're going to have to avoid business class flights. TK, what would you do? China's it's banks under higher pressure to reduce costs and raise margins in the race of, in the face of bad loans and issues in the property sector. Authorities in China have already eased deposit rates and slashed reserve requirements, cutting yeah. costs in China, boosting salaries in Japan. <clears throat> very different stories taking place. OK, how would you deal with, Tom? The Central Commission for Discipline Inspection in China. Yes, for surveillance? It's a good yes. question. This is the one yes. for surveillance. Sorry. I saw that name and I was thinking, if you had well, to report your Amex bills to the Central Commission for Discipline Inspection, how would that go? Yeah, Red Oak Keeper of the Amex has something <laughs> very much equivalent to that. Pro tip here, folks. We'd love for you to know about what the Zeitgeist is doing. George Magnus, of course, iconic at UBS, has been incredibly strong on Twitter the last number of days. I'll put that out on Twitter and LinkedIn. George Magnus on China has been lights out. Wrote a piece in The Guardian, yeah. I think, recently. Yeah, I read the same yeah. piece. Yeah. Fantastic piece. He's been, he's been very, very uh, strong. Let's get to it right now. Sarah Hewen joining us. And this is something John Farrow has not forgotten about. I have. And that is Europe, ahead of Europe and America's research at Standard uh, Charter. I want to digress here, Sarah, away from the U.S. economic data we're going to see. We haven't even addressed at the beginning of the year the challenges of Christine Lagarde. How are her inflation challenges different than those of Jerome Powell? Sure that there, there are too many differences in terms of the challenges because in both cases you have a strong labour market and um, the, the question is, you know, are the, is the Fed, the ECB, are they taking a different approach to those strong labour markets? We had a very, very clear message from Christine Lagarde at the last ECB meeting that domestic inflation pressures were the concern, that uh, full employment and ongoing labour market pressures were a concern and that that's why the ECB right. is cautious why they're not talking about rate cuts. Um, the Fed's view seems to be, uh, you know, we, we, we're getting a soft landing. Inflation is coming down. Uh, we're not too concerned about um, labour market strength. But I would note what what happens to wage growth tomorrow. Uh, we saw for the November payroll right. report, average hourly earnings up stronger than expected. So that could 
be right. a concern going forward. Well, let's go right there because that was, I thought, the high point of your research note. On wage growth, you take average hourly earnings, AHE. I bring it over to ECI, which is wages and benefits. What's the efficacy of AHE for you tomorrow at 8.30? I think that, I mean, we, we are expecting a slowdown, to be fair. We think that we'll see a softer monthly growth, but uh, that's against the backdrop of last time around, um, higher year on year, um, higher monthly, higher on a three month and six month annualise, all the sorts of measures that the Fed likes to, to look at. Um, and the reason why I think it is still very much worth taking account of what's going on there is because the disinflationary forces that have weighed on inflation to date, uh, goods inflation, imported inflation, commodity prices, uh, we're starting to see those reverse now. We're seeing a pickup in commodity prices. Obviously, geopolitical factors are behind that. Higher freight costs, a real jump in freight costs um, when we've got used to seeing them really flatlining over the past year or so. Um, and what central bankers will be concerned about is that you haven't brought your core inflation down um, far enough before the benefit from uh, weaker energy and food prices uh, starts to reverse and your headline inflation catches up and, and starts to take over. Uh, take over. So the um, wage earnings section is very important, not just for the Fed, but also for the ECB. But I would say at the moment, central bankers are taking a slightly different slant on what's going on and the, the, those fundamental drivers of domestic inflation pressures. With that in mind, Sarah, when you compare and contrast, you and a team, the differences between the ECB and the Federal Reserve, how different are the thresholds for rate cuts? Who goes first? What have you penciled in for 2024? Well, we do have the ECB going first. We think that they'll cut by the second quarter. Um, they're shrugging aside weakness in the economy, but we think that that is going to become more of a factor. Obviously, inflation this time around for December is likely to nudge higher year on year because of base effects, but the broad trend is, um, is moving in the right direction. And ultimately, we think that um, by the... Uh, but, by the second quarter, by the, the, the next set of forecasts that we get, I guess, for June, they, they will be signalling clearly that there will be uh, inflation on target over their time horizon. Um, possibly they get there a little bit earlier, but we do see a sort of more cautious approach from ECB. So we think second quarter rate cuts. For the Fed, we've, we've got the third quarter uh, factored in. But I have to say that the commentary that we had at the last FOMC seemed to be giving greater emphasis to um, the uh, perhaps the underlying growth of the economy and potentially the need to not over tighten or not hold rates too high for too long, um, which could suggest um, that they, they move earlier than the third quarter. Obviously, markets are expecting um, that, that they could move as soon as uh, the, the, next, uh, the next couple of months. We think that that will be too soon. The minutes, I suggest, were more cautious than maybe the um, than Powell's commentary after the last FOMC meeting. That tug of war between market expectations and communication from the Fed continues. Sarah, great to catch up. Happy New Year. Sarah Hewin there of Standard Chartered on the difference between the ECB and the Federal Reserve. Lisa, I think it was City's Andrew Hollenhorst yesterday who just said fine-tuning the message. The Fed minutes were fine-tuning the message after what we heard from Chairman Powell in the news conference. And what does that mean? When it means, can you walk it back? You put the toothpaste back in the tube? The answer is no. Can we just say how much of a cover Jay Powell has given to Christine Lagarde? Basically, she could come out and say nothing, and she'd be looked at as the winner after Jay Powell came out with a message that roiled markets, because she all she had to do was to sort of hew to this sort of vague message that nobody believed anyway, and the euro would get a boost, and they'd sort of, you know, have some sort of... Lack of drama relative to Jay Powell. I, I, I think there's, that's a convenience that we have, that these central banks are linked, that Governor Bailey's on the red phone talking to Jerome Powell in Washington. How was and your Starbucks What coffee other rumors are we going to start? <laughs> but, but the basic idea to me is Lagarde is completely distracted, like perhaps the collapse of manufacturing in Germany and the productivity of Germany, which is an arch change from where it was five, six, seven years ago. Something like that looms a lot larger. And of course, also the historic inflation uh, battle as well. The, 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 business, model, the business model of the country, Tom. I'm yeah. pleased you mentioned it. Yeah.
complete <laughs> rethink going on in parts of Europe about yeah. how best to move forward. Yeah. Coming up shortly, Damien Sasser of Bloomberg Intelligence on China. Better than OK, TK, you yeah, know that. Okay. Equity futures on the Stay S&P. For the <laughs> Just about unchanged from New York. This is Bloomberg. The challenge here for the Fed is that they still want to have the soft landing, and we all want to have the soft landing. That would be the best outcome, of course, from so many dimensions. But what is beginning to matter is that they have now sucked so much liquidity out. We've gotten to a point where we are beginning to see some strains in the plumbing. Torsten Slock there of Apollo Management, the chief economist, just absolutely phenomenal yesterday at clinic and well worth going over again. Find that interview on Bloomberg.com. For the broader price action this morning, good morning to you. We are pulling back just a touch from where we were about an hour ago. We're now essentially unchanged on the S&P 500 after three days of losses, just about holding on. Some key data later this morning. Starts at 8.15, the ADP report. Do whatever you want with that. <laughs> I'm not going to suggest it's important. It's not important. You'll decide once it comes out. There we go. <laughs> 8.30 Eastern time, jobless claims is important. That one just ahead of payrolls, Lisa. 24 hours after that, the payrolls report, the estimates so far, as I often say, moving target as we get those estimates coming through. In our survey, the meet an estimate, 171. We're not seeing real weakness. That's the bottom line. If anything, we're seeing strength, but we're seeing weakening. And this is one of the most difficult things to trade because when you see sort of a linear move, is it going to be linear or is it going to be non-linear in terms of shifting downward, uh, which is some, what some people are concerned about? And for those of you that want the estimate on jobless claims, 216 down from 218 on the ADP report. We're looking for something like 125, Tom, for the month of December, which is slightly higher than the 103 we posted previously. All of that for you at 830 and Michael McKee leading our coverage here into tomorrow's jobs report. We will go beneath the headline data. Always beneath the headline data is Damian Sassar, Chief Emerging Market Credit Strategist for Bloomberg Intelligence. And he knows that when the acts of UBS, former now at Oxford, I should say, George Magnus writes, you read it and listen. George Magnus with a tour de force in The Guardian a couple days ago, alluding to the instabilities of China mm. back to Japan of 1994. Mm -hmm. Have they screwed it up so bad they're like Japan of 1994? Well, let me put it back to you. Why are we even talking about China here? It's certainly not from an investment perspective. Everyone I talk to, I mean, considers China to be broadly uninvestable. I'm talking oh, about foreign investment. Is it investors. straw hats and winter? You buy it right now? Well, I think, I think you think you talk about it because it's the world's second largest economy and what's the pass through to the U.S. and Europe and to demand writ large. And from that perspective, the, you know, it, it's dire. The conditions domestically are dire and getting worse. If you look at PMI data or average salaries, which have declined 1.3 percent, the biggest year-over-year -year declines since 2016. I mean, there's plenty of data to point to. But, you know, I'd much rather talk about U.S. Treasury yields because the pass through <laughs> from U.S. yields into emerging markets, which is where I live and breathe, is going to have a much greater impact on valuations and performance through the full year. Well, let's talk about both. When you look at EM as an asset class, has the aversion towards China shaped the approach elsewhere? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, look, I mean, I think in this market, what you're looking at more or less is LATAM and EMEA. You really can't look at Asia because it's a low yielding environment. And the fact is, central banks didn't have to hike as aggressively because inflation is kind of structurally low there. Um, that doesn't mean that there aren't opportunities there. But if you look at places like Indonesia, they're still raising rates in, the, in what is effectively an easing cycle synchronized across the rest of the globe. So from an EM perspective, nominal and real yields are still very high in Latin America, still very high in EMEA. And from a valuation perspective, for those of you that believe that carries kind of had its day in the sun four years of outperformance, and we're going to kind of have this regime shift toward value as being the driver of EM currency performance, well, then you probably do want to look to the EMEA region. From that perspective, Hungary, Czech, and a lot of those names come out. I'm not going to let you discard the China discussion so quickly <sighs> because I know it's complicated and I know that nobody's been able to get it right. But recently, we're seeing yields go down pretty significantly on Chinese uh, bonds. And this is because there is this promise of more stimulus. Yeah. There seems to be heightened concern on the part of the PBOC, Xi Jinping, about the economic considerations in the nation. How much can you lean into that, given the fact that some people are starting to say, look, it's so uninvestable that it looks like a good deal? Lisa, it's right to focus on that because the stimulus that China kind of injects into that economy is going to filter through into the broader world at large. But I think what you're saying is actually spot on. The data points you want to look at, 3% budget deficit, that's what they're targeting, 3% of GDP. That target was set last March. They never reached it because of the broad fiscal stimulus. It actually, I think, declined in China in large part because of what you're pointing out, lower China yields, weaker yuan. So every yuan of stimulus they're injecting into the economy in dollar terms is worth that much less. And so from my perspective, 
perspective. Stimulus does matter in China, but it's got to be the right stimulus. It's got to be the execution of delivering that stimulus. And that's where things get a little bit dicey in my mind. I think it's interesting that you also didn't want to focus on China because so many people say it's uninvestable. There was a report that came out that was highlighted on the terminal talking about Citigroup, JP Morgan, Bank of America and Morgan Stanley collectively have reduced their exposure to China by about a fourth since 2020. Mm -hmm. This has a, been a dramatic uh, retracement out of that country, the world's second biggest economy. Does this make it difficult for people to even play in the spaces they wanted to? In other words, is this basically an uninvestable area just because a lot of financial firms don't want to engage given the unpredictability of policy. So clarify for me, are you talking about their investments or their companies, like banking branches in China? Because I think it's important to differentiate between that. And when I say is, I mean, we're reading and we're hearing about data transfer rules, cross-border data transfer in China is becoming increasingly difficult. The cost, the cost burden of doing business in China from the perspective of JP Morgan, Goldman, Morgan Stanley, et cetera, has become so hard because they have to ring fence their local operations from the broader bank because of this data transfer and all the stuff that goes on, compliance driven, et cetera. And so, you know, it is a very difficult endeavor to invest in China from the perspective of the C-suite, right? And I think that is kind of filtering its way down into investment portfolios, et cetera. Okay, I want to go to something actually in the Damien world. You mentioned LATAM as being interesting. Yes. The bonus de tesoro area of Peru. Oh, okay, I'm, I'm, so I'm, I'm buying so it with a 6 and 7 H price. yield right now. Yeah. It's down 32% from the beginning of the pandemic. It's come back a little bit as well. How do mere mortals on TV buy the Ten bonus due to yeah. sore area of 2034? Yeah, no, I mean, your guess is as good as mine. You're going to have to call your broker at JP Morgan to get a proper quote. No, I'm kidding. I mean, you can do it. I mean, you wouldn't do it because the denomination. Big banks, do they actually follow this stuff, or is this just the world? How many U.S. Yeah. Treasuries do you own outright in your portfolio? I'm not your bad example, but most people don't own <laughs> U.S. You. Treasury notes in their portfolio. They own an ETF or some. They get exposure, you know, kind of that way. Um, in in Peru, if you're looking at Peru 10 years, which we like in a hard landing scenario because it's a dollarized economy and yields are high on a nominal basis. Um, the only so way to really the get top, that exposure is via an ETF. What's the top Bramo can get in her 401k from the bonus to Tesori area what's that of you? 2034? Why do you like saying that? I don't so know, I just enjoy butchering it. I have no idea. <laughs> like, what, like, what is this? <laughs> I mean, look, there are a lot of, uh, there are a lot of fun sounding instruments. We could talk about Tia swaps <laughs> in Mexico. I mean, they're wonderful. But are you talking 20% uh, pop in your We could talk machine? about Ray I and DI futures in Brazil. No, I'm kidding. But I think, Look, Brazil, Mexico, Peru as well, um, you know, the yields are really high on both a nominal and a real basis, and they're attracting a lot of investors to their shores. And it's showing up in spot FX performance, spot EMFX performance. Forget about total returns, which includes all the interest return, was actually positive in 2023 for the first time in, what, five, six years. Amazing. Let's Amazing. finish on this. I think sometimes on programs like these, we say things that are actually really, really important, gloss over them and move on. We're talking about the world's second largest economy. Yeah and the markets of the world's second largest economy being uninvestable. Yeah. And we're sitting around this table as if that's just something you know, everyone knows already. Right. Does that matter to leadership in China that you have got a whole universe of investors that are looking at an economy that is so important to the world and yet we believe, and I say we, I'm talking about a group of investors, they believe that that economy and those markets are uninvestable. I mean, I'm, cer I'm certain that Beijing does not like the sound of that, um, but I don't think they're listening so much to what you or I or Tom or Lisa are really saying, Jonathan, or for that matter, Jamie Dimon and a lot of other people. Yeah, they take it with, you know, some meaning, of course, but I don't think, you know, there's much they can do about it, A, at this point, but B, you know, it would take a regime shift or something really, you know, to dial back a lot of the, 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 the constraints that, you know, President Xi and, and, and Beijing put on the broader economy to dial a lot of that back at this point would be almost an admission of failure. It, it's, it, it wouldn't happen, I don't think. And so, look, I'm not a Ch I, I profess to be somebody who knows a lot about China and how to incorporate our China views into a broader portfolio, but I am not a China expert, and I do not know what's going on inside the walls of Beijing, and I'm, I need to make that clear. But, yeah, I mean, from the people who I speak to, I, I trust, you know, implicitly, they do not have China in their portfolios at all. Just an amazing shift over yeah. the last few years. Damien, thank, thank you. Good to see you. Happy New Year. Damien Sasser of Bloomberg Intelligence. TK, we say it so casually. China, uninvestable. It's yeah. just become the I consensus view totally on the street in the last few years. I totally agree with you. It's a seismic change, and I'm reading as much as I can on it. And it, it stops, as you say, John, with the government, with a totalitarian regime, and what's the next step? 
Uh, that's the reason why I was interested in the Central Commission for Discipline Inspection, which I do like saying, but this is the China group uh, <coughs> that told bankers last year to abandon the pretense of the financial leap by cleaning up their, quote, hedonistic lifestyles. Basically, this is what caused the lack of flying first class, et cetera. How coherent is a thriving banking system with a country that has professed to be communist? Does that mesh up? And if you start to have the sort of ideologies of communism being more uh, directly imposed in the country, how do you get any confidence that they're going to really uh, invest with some sort of capitalistic uh, sort of overlay? Tell us, Tom, is the first class cabin a little quieter? What's it like over there? Yeah, it is. It's yeah. quieter. Yes, yeah, no question about it. John, I, you know, I don't have the Peru piece, but my Austrian piece, I mean, it was only down 74 <laughs> percent at the bottom. The Has it bounced? Yeah, per, you know, nice. it's bounced. It's got it's a little a Austrian, you know. Veldery, Veldera, bounce. I can tell you, equity futures totally unchanged on the S&P. Coming up, Katie Kaminsky of Alpha Simplex on whether she's short treasuries. Are you in recession or are you not in recession? And we have a very low probability of recession this year. We are not out of the woods when it comes to battling inflation. The pain trade is that everybody thinks that inflation is fully vanquished. Either inflation falls because the economy continues to weaken or the economy stays strong. What we need to focus on is what's happening with the data and what we need to understand from the Fed is, is it only inflation or are they taking into account a slightly soft after economy. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. New Year hangover continues. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Abramowitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Your equity market on the S&P today, this morning, totally unchanged. After yesterday, three-day losing streak on the S&P, four-day losing streak on the Nasdaq 100. TK, a real struggle, a stumble out of the gate for the new year. A little better to tape after the two days of carnage that we've seen. We've got a wonderful person coming up, John, who was wrong, wrong, wrong last year year. And John, you see that within the jobs report moving from early December over to now where you go from 4.23% to 3.96%. Guess what? The world has changed at the beginning of 2024. Next stop is the economic data. Later this morning, we'll get jobless claims, Lisa, the ADP report, setting up the big one tomorrow morning. Payroll's just around the corner. How high is the bar for it to really shift the needle on the narrative? This is really my question at a time where we're seeing incremental shifts and incremental weakening to the labor market, but not anything that necessarily screams some sort of cataclysmic uh, fissure in the labor market. You're laughing, but it's seriously, how does the market deal with vague and sort of incremental moves? Not well, and that's what we're seeing. Well, you've got a gap right now that we need to talk about. How'd you close this spread? The implied forecast, if you want to call it that, the median dot in the dot plot for the Federal Reserve for where the dots will be at the end of the year. You know where I'm going with this. And where the market is priced for rate cuts through the year so far. How does that close? We got some pushback, I think, in a minute yesterday. City's Andrew Holness called it a fine-tuning event fine-tuning a very dovish meeting. And in Zetra Morgan Stanley said rate cuts aren't coming soon. I mentioned this quite a few times already, Lisa, worth repeating. Jeffrey saying attempting to put the toothpaste back into the tube. So this is what fine-tuning looks like. Before some of these minutes came out and some of the rhetoric came out, we saw almost an 86% chance of a Fed rate cut in March. Now that's <coughs> all the way back down to 65% chance. So it's, it's still necessarily getting priced into the market, right. but not maybe with as much conviction. And to me, what's so important here is they are wedded to a Greenspanian measured. I mean, every single conversation, whatever anyone's belief, we're going to be measured and move incrementally a quarter point at a time, where a lot of people are begging for Arthur Burns, where they say, okay, things have changed. We're going to move once, but we're not measured. We're just moving to move. I don't hear that out there. So this is the economic data and how the Fed might respond to it. Let's talk about the earnings as well. Two Fridays away, JP Morgan results just around the corner. We'll be talking about the big banks first. Then early February, we need to talk about Apple. Apple, the standout name, as you might expect, already to start the year. We had a downgrade from Barclays, got another one this morning. Lisa, this time from Piper Sandler's <coughs> Harsh Kumar. Downgrading the stock to neutral from overweight, talking about valuation concerns and broader handset and macro weakness for the first half of this year. 
the thing that we keep talking about is we all know this. This was not a new story. We were talking about this last year. They did not see sales growth, and yet their shares still rose about 50 percent. We're seeing that come off. How much further does that have to go after the longest streak of losses in the NASDAQ 100 going back a couple of months? Is Mr. Master, he's got buy orders in this morning at Cupertino. I mean, I, I, saw, I believe I saw a model yesterday. They're going to spend $80 billion or $50 billion. The number doesn't matter. The answer is a lot of money on share buybacks. If you love this puppy at 200, you got to really love it at 182, right? Well, all I can say is, if you take that logic and you brought it out to the big tech sphere, did you see Mark Zuckerberg of Meta sold the greatest amount of his own personal shares going back to 2021 yeah, on the like heels of everything? My point is, how much can you glean from whether they're buying or they're selling, right? If they are going to not do buybacks, does that mean that they don't have faith if they can necessarily generate the growth in, in the ongoing uh, at Apple? It's a monster cash machine, TK, which is yeah. the point you're making at Apple. It will continue to be a monster cash machine through the year, over the next year. <clears throat> Tom, the problem was for last year is that what you saw was an expansion in multiples at the same time that their core product wasn't seeing any sales growth. That was the tension. Now, look, the bulls were right on the stock. Whether they were right for the right reasons, I don't know. We can talk to the bulls on Apple about that. But ultimately, that's the challenge, Tom, coming into 2024. Yeah, can you really repeat that act in 24 after what you saw in 23? Yeah, the nuance there is foreign exchange adjustment and also the premium uh, phone sales, the unit sales as well. But the short answer here, not to beat it to death, is there's a raging debate, like on the 10-year yield, as there is on Apple Computer. Stock is down 0.7%. We'll talk about the bond market in just a moment. Here's the broader price action. Equity futures on the S&P, three-day losing streak on the S&P through the close yesterday. This morning, just moments ago, Lisa, turning negative on the S&P 500. All right. In 55 minutes, we're going to get German December CPI. Very curious to see uh, European yes. inflation reads and how that really features into the Fed ECB divide that we keep hearing about and the bond market more broadly. Meanwhile, 8.15 a.m., we get the ADP December employment change. Tom follows that very carefully and trades aggressively off it. 8.30 a.m. We also get initial jobless claims, which may be more important. Yesterday's jolts data showed a softening in the market that was material when you look at, the, at measures like the U.S. quits rate, uh, which ticked to the lowest going back to September 2020. When people aren't quitting, they don't have confidence that they can get another job. That's the sort of idea behind why this is important. And at 9.45 a.m., we get S&P Global U.S. Services PMI focused very much on services since that has been the stalwart of expansion, even as we see manufacturing contract. Should we talk about the journey of an investor, a painful one. It felt good for a long, long time. You're short treasuries. You start the year at 390 on a 10 year. It gets to late October, October 23rd to be precise, and a 10 year yield goes to 5.02%. You're feeling good about that short. You stay short. Then all of a sudden, the 10 year goes back to where it started, 390 to end the year, just where it started the year in 2023. Joining us now, someone who was short through most of that year, Kelly Kaminsky, Chief Research Strategist of Alpha Simplex, punishing that bond market, Katie. You were short. We talked about it. It felt good for a while. Then this market turned. Katie, I guess you're still short after the pain of the last couple of months. And what changed for you? No, um, trend signals have finally turned long. And I think this is an epic signal for the market because we have been short for nine quarters. This has been one of the longest shorts in trend following history over the last 20 to 40 years. And I think this is important because it signals the end of the tightening cycle and it suggests that we're going through a regime change and that we need to start looking at the next phase of the bond market. And for me, that's looking for a steep real yield curve. And I'm trying to think about what is going to be the catalyst for that as the next phase of this trade. It's one thing not to be short, Katie. It's another thing to be aggressively long. Where does trend following signal send you? So right now they're still rather muted, but I think the key that we're gonna have to watch is how fast are cuts coming. And I also think we have to be a little bit nervous too. We need to watch what's happening with supply and treasuries to look at the end of the curve to see what's happening there as well as we try to navigate this year as weaker data might come in and as we try to roll over debt throughout the year. So I think this is gonna be a year to watch the shape of the curve and to see where uh, the curve actually settles out. When you talk about a steepening in the yield curve, it can come from two places. It can come from short-term yields coming down in response to Fed rate cuts, or it could come to, uh, from longer-term yields rising aggressively. Are you basically saying because you are no longer short treasuries, that you see it more coming from the front end with more aggressive rate cutting cycle than people are expecting? 
Well, that's the trade that everyone's focused on. And I think that's where everyone's focused right now. You were just mentioning it that, you know, we're focused on how soon are cuts coming um, and when are we going to see the, sh the shorter end of the curve sort of deepen so that we have this this more steep yield curve. I think where you have to worry, the typical thing that would be the challenge is if we start to see more challenging uh effects on the long end of the curve, aka, uh, you know, poor, poor fixed income market on the long end. So that would happen if we had trouble um, in terms of valuations for debt. And so that would happen mm -hmm. if we had poor, you know, poor auctions in the Treasury market. So that's something I'm going to yeah. be watching this year. Katie, let's talk to Global Wall Street right now that hangs on your every word on trend based CTA uh, uh, technical analysis. So we had a trend to a higher yield in the 10 year. We've rolled over. The, the indeterminate point I call soup. Are we in a trend of soup now, indeterminate? Or can you state that we have a trend towards lower yield? Is a trend in place of higher prices and lower yield? So we hit the inflection point and we've started moving towards longer, uh, longer signals, especially in most asset classes, particularly equities. Uh, we've also seen um, very strong short signals in the US dollar. So we've really seen that inflation trade that we were seeing for pretty much two years dissipate and move past a point where we're moving towards right. a new trend. You sound like Luis Yamada there talking about dissipation. What will it take to get trend in place where there's a permanence to weak dollar, a permanence to lower yield? I think rate cuts, as expected, would definitely um, continue that trend strongly. Of course, not as weak data if we continue to see this sort of soft landing be a possibility. Um, and I think that is going to be in question, of course, because my general view this year is that we're going to see a lot of variation in outcomes. Um, I want to point out one key fact. A, bond volatility still remains elevated and bond stock correlation still remains positive. Those are two technical factors that are very different than the classic regime. So we need to navigate those first before we can figure out sort of have we moved to sort of back to where we were or are we moving somewhere else? Hey, Katie, let's finish there. We caught up with someone just yesterday from JP Morgan. Lisa mentioned them, Phil Camparelli. He talked about 60-40 being back and that 40 would enable you to play defense. Is there any reason to believe that it is back? Are you seeing anything that suggests that correlation is going back to what some people might call slightly more intuitive? I think everyone wants that. But I think the worry is what I just said. We're seeing very different asset class relationships. So we need to watch inflation and watch for how inflation behaves because inflation changes the nature of asset class relationships. If we should see inflation have upside risk potential, we will see more challenge that 60-40 narrative. If, in fact, we can keep inflation under control, I agree. The 60-40 is a good place to be. But so watching inflation and keeping that in check, and that's why the Fed is probably being more conservative and being careful. Um, because they want to make sure that's the case. Katie, appreciate the update. Happy New Year. It's good to catch up. Katie Kaminsky of Alpha Simplex, no longer short this bond market after a rip roaring rally through November and December. Lisa, please, you brought that up. It's so, so important. This 60 40 call, the return of the 40 being a defensive story, that we retain those risk mitigation characteristics when they have been the source of risk for much of the last 12 months. And what Kitty was saying was really important that it only goes back to being a 60 40 kind of ballast if inflation comes down materially, because then suddenly we're not talking about inflation as the main risk, which it has been for so much of the past 24 months. If you are just joining us, welcome to the program. Here's the equity market for you. A bit of a struggle to start 2024. The last two days have been a couple of days of losses. You put it all together, three days of losses through the end of 23 into 24 on the S&P 500, four days of losses on the Nasdaq 100. Equity futures here on the S&P up by just 0.04%. Yields higher by, let's call it four basis points, 395.92. With economic data, Lisa, about an hour away. Yeah, what we've got first is the ADP uh, report, which does come out, doesn't necessarily have a direct correlation to tomorrow's uh, non-farm payrolls report, but still, again, all of these indicators get more important when all of a sudden it's incremental. I keep focusing on that because I got to say, it is hard for a market that's used to whipsawing to respond to incremental moves. Do you get an oversized move in markets oh. that are kind of 
on pins and needles trying to come up with a new discussion point. The new discussion point is the new narrative, and I think it's huge indecision on what the new narrative is. There's people making bets. That's their job. Strategist jobs is to make the bet. But today and tomorrow, and I believe it's uh, January 11th at CPI, I'm guessing, the answer is we're going to have a lot of narrative here out to get to January 11 before J.P. Morgan's earnings. I can confirm on my screen it is the 11th, Nailed the that. CPI. I don't know Good. how to do that. <laughs> and then after that is J.P. Morgan earnings. So that's the calendar is packed. You've got all the earnings. Starts next week for the big banks. Got all the data. Tom mentioned the 11th for CPI this Friday for payrolls. And then we've got these spending deadlines for the government down in Washington, D.C. And we need to talk about that too. One deadline is the 19th of this month. The other deadline, early February. Coming up very shortly. Greg Valliere of AGF Investments to weigh in on all of that. And in the next hour, Drew Mattis of MetLife is going to join us to go through some of these bond market moves. Equities this morning just about positive on the S&P 500 from a beautiful New York City. Good morning. The jobs report last month beat estimates. That is a stunning number. That is what nobody was expecting. The bullish train has left the station. This is what Powell does not want to see. This Friday, Tom, Jonathan, Lisa, and Mike will bring you crucial data and expert analysis at terminal speed. You're really not seeing the level of restrictiveness show up yet in the labor market. Significant job growth and high labor force participation. There's a very strong chance that the market is mispriced for 2024. The December jobs report, Friday on Bloomberg Television and Radio. base case is drama, brinkmanship. It does seem like we could easily get that government shutdown. Um, but from a market perspective, yeah, you know, I tell clients to kind of pay attention to that longer term uh, provision. I do think we will get government funded. We will get a defense supplemental. We will get something on the border. It's just a question of timing. The two deadlines over the next four weeks in Washington, D.C. That was Ed Mills, the Washington policy analyst over at Raymond James here in New York City. Good morning to you. Equities just about unchanged on the S&P 500 after a few days of losses on both the S&P and the Nasdaq to kick off 2024. Unchanged now on the S&P and the bond market yields higher by, let's call it four basis points on a 10 year, 396.11 on a 10 year. In foreign exchange, the euro just a little stronger here by a quarter of one percent against the dollar, 109.50. If you want to sit on crude just for a moment, Picking up yesterday, biggest one-day rally going back to November, middle of November, I think, TK. Pick it up again today by 1%, $73 and about 40 cents. You have to watch it, the spread there between America's price of oil as a dominant provider and Brent crude as well, which maybe has more to do with the Eastern Mediterranean, $78.83 on Brent crude. And, you know, it went down and it's sort of trying to come back against this horrific backdrop of news. And it's escalating, right? I mean, that seems to be the clear uh, discussion from overnight. There was an article in the New York Times where Admiral James Stavridi uh, said this, the chances of a regional war in the Middle East go up from 15 percent to as high as 30 percent in light of the recent attacks in Iran and given some of the discussion. Does the war spread, Tom? The prospect of escalation is the number one question right. over the last three months. Crude is trade lower through October, through November, through December. We're still asking <clears throat> the same question. We're going to digress right now. And joining us is someone with huge experience on America's attitude towards the Eastern Mediterranean and something talked less about, which is Lebanon. This is, of course, northern Israel and the Hezbollah and all the news flow we've seen there. Greg Vallier joins Chief U.S. Policy Strategist at AGF Investments. I mentioned, Greg, a small matter of the U.S. Marine Corps in Beirut 40 years ago. I got a huge response on social on that. What is the American relationship with a fractured Lebanon? Essentially, no government, Hezbollah active there as well. What is our policy there now? Well, I don't think we want to get into a full-fledged conflict, uh, Tom, but you look at the assassination earlier this week of a Hamas leader, you look at what happened yesterday in Iran, 100 people killed, uh, and the Iranian leadership is blaming the U.S. and Israel. I don't think the U.S. or Israel had anything to do with that bombing. I think it had to do with other factors within Iran. But th this is a tinderbox with the Red Sea and the Persian Gulf being crucial for oil. And I suspect things may get more tense before they get better. What do we need to see from our State Department? How do we extend to a greater conflict in the eastern Mediterranean? 
I think we have to make it clear that we're prepared to uh, get involved. Uh, I think we can't just sit by and see uh, shipping lanes in the Red Sea or the Persian Gulf uh, stay undefended. So th this will call for tough rhetoric at the very least. Tough rhetoric at a time where the U.S. is still struggling to figure out how they're going to pay for some of uh, the funding behind the rhetoric. How much does this discussion play into some of the deadlines that we've been talking about January 19th with one funding deadline, early February with another? Yeah, you know, Lisa, everyone's been very sanguine that, oh, we'll get a deal by January 19th. We'll get something on February 2nd. There's a new player in town who is not that inclined to compromise, and that's Mike Johnson, the new Speaker of the House. He made it clear yesterday that this is not just radical Republicans saying we don't want to spend more money. It's all of the Republicans, and their big mantra is the border. And unless there's a, a, a serious border bill, and I don't think there's anything close to a deal yet, I think things could grind to a halt in the next few weeks without a deal. People have gotten so immune to the idea of uh, just complete stasis in Washington, D.C., on the brink of dysfunction or outright dysfunction. At what point, Greg, does it start to matter for a longer term kind of perspective that there are these government shutdowns that are constantly being floated and that there is this sort of hardline approach being taken where it seems like there's not going to be a deal anytime soon? If there's nothing or if there's a delay, and you certainly can't rule that out, what kind of a signal does that send to our allies? What does it send to Ukraine, which desperately needs more funding? What does it say to the Israelis, to Taiwan, to, to others? I think that's one big concern. The other is just consumer confidence. Uh, consumers in the U.S. <laughs> may begin to see, as you say, right. the stasis without anything getting done. Greg, Gallup did a great treatment in the summer of last year on how we feel about immigration. You followed this through cycle after cycle. You've read the history of it uh, uh, across decades and decades. We went from 77 percent, immigration is good, and we're down into the 60s, and it's been a little rocky. Do we believe immigration is good on Capitol Hill? Too much immigration is not good, Tom. And last year, we let two million people in at the U.S.-Texas border. That is not sustainable. And if you don't believe me, talk to all the Democrats who are mayors around America. They're desperate. They don't know how to fund uh, aid to these people, and there's still more coming in. So, Greg, let's talk about who's running the party. You mentioned Speaker Johnson. Is it Speaker Johnson or whoever's leading the polls in the primaries? Who is it? Well, I, I think they're just fighting for second place, uh, John. I, I don't see uh, this may be a chance in New Hampshire that Trump could slip below 50 percent. Trump will do very well in Iowa. I did a piece earlier this week saying that we could see Trump as the presumptive nominee by Super Tuesday, which is March 5th. Wow. It's entirely possible this will be over in two months. So, Greg, let's go to the spending bill, the border agreement. What does an agreement look like that makes Republicans happy? How big is that bill? What does it look like? A de facto wall, I think something that militant, a lot more money for uh, agents, uh, sending people back, uh, a, a lot will have to be in this bill. And the Republicans in recent weeks have become emboldened to ask for more. Particularly given the headlines we've seen, Tom, I saw a number like 300,000 yeah. for the month of December. There's been, been a shift. There's record been a month, shift. record There's month. A shift. Uh, yeah, Bloomberg News with Matt Winkler's leadership has been great about following this immigration debate. I mean, this goes on years and years. Greg knows this as well. But you're right. In the last number of weeks, it's reached a new point. There's no, whatever anybody's belief on it, we're at a new, not frenzy, but new study of what are we going to do. Hey, Greg, thank you. Good to catch up. Greg Valier there of AGF <laughs> Investments. Greg, Happy New Year. It's EK The Change, and Greg mentioned it. The crisis was on the border and what's taken place in the last 12 months. The crisis is now on the doorstep of blue states that could look from above and look down and say this is not a problem. And now it's everyone's yeah. problem. I'll give you one anecdote. I gave a speech in Arizona, and I'm driving on the road, as usual, John, in the back seat of the fancy car, and I said some East Coast bow tie BS, and the limo driver took my head off. And he said, you're in the Northeast, you don't know the issues. This had to have been... 200 miles from the border, I'd but say. To the point that we're seeing, in even in blue states, you're starting to see busloads of uh, immigrants come in, and it's really posing a strain on the social system. There's a real question here why there isn't more urgency on both sides, right? I mean, you've got this sort of Republican pressure, but on the flip side, where is 
President Biden on this. He has sort of nodded to this idea that there is some issue that needs to be resolved. Why are we not hearing about the nitty gritty in a more concrete well, way? Because there is responsible immigration and this is a nation of immigrants and that's right. uh, a great thing, the, but it has to be controlled. The nitty gritty to me is the Hispanic vote, the black vote as well, maybe a suck the other groups uh, as well that I don't have in front of me. But the answer is this is hugely dynamic and it's something all of these politicians are, are following. The, the things we took for granted Four years ago, eight years ago, 12 yeah. years ago, John, out the window, absolutely out the window. Totally. Something we'll continue to follow in this election year. Coming up on the program, Woody Caesar of Credit Sites, their conversation just around the corner. Price action shaping up as follows on the S&P 500, just about unchanged. The story of the next hour or so, 8.15 Eastern time, the ADP report, the appetizer for the payrolls report tomorrow morning. Then at 8.30 Eastern time, a little bit later this morning, jobless claims in America. The estimate, 216K. From New York City, this is Bloomberg. Let's go straight to the scores in the market right now on the S&P 500, trying to bounce and struggling up by 0.1%. Negative again on the Nasdaq 100. Nasdaq 100, four-day losing streak. Four-day losing streak. Incidentally, the last time we had a day of gains on the Nasdaq was late December on the 27th, I believe, which was the <coughs> low on the 10-year for 4Q, which was 3.78. And since then, yields have been climbing just consistently. It's been a slow grind, but look at where we are now from 3.78, which was the session low on December 27th to where we are now on a 10 year, if you switch up the board, two year, 10 year, 30 year looks like this. The 10 year at the moment, Lisa, at 395. So we have drifted higher over the last week or so. With people pushing back on this idea that the Fed is going to cut for, what, six times this year? And I think that that's been sort of the theme of the beginning of this year. But it's been incremental. And that's what the minutes have also shown, incremental. And that's why it's been very difficult to hinge on a new narrative, because traders that have been used to overdramatic swings are not good at incremental. Yields drifting higher, Tom, incrementally again this morning by a single basis point, the two-year, 435. Off the news, let's remind ourselves we're here one hour on the key beginning of the news. I mean, you know, ADP, yeah, okay, but, you know, the claims, I'm sorry, it's real. And then tomorrow, a real, real story here with the jobs report, and that's going to be part of the narrative onto inflation. January 11. The estimate 171. Let's get to foreign exchange. Then I want a single name. We'll talk about Apple just briefly as well. In FX at the moment, the Euro 109.54. The Euro trying to bounce. A bit of strength there. Had a bit of dollar strength to start the year. Some weakness this morning. The Euro 109.54. Positive on that currency pair by 0.3%. Let's talk about Apple, which was talked about yesterday following a downgrade from Barclays. This morning, the downgrade from Piper Sandler and Harsh Kumar. A downgrade to neutral from overweight. The stock is down by 0.7%. Every analyst has their view. It's worth talking about the history of Harsh Kumar over at Piper Sandler. A buy on the stock, Lisa, since spring of 2020. Buy, 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 buy. And guess what? For good reason, because this stock has basically tripled since then and now turning neutral. To me, it's fascinating to see this sort of pile on that happens as people realize maybe after it's rallied 50 percent, eh, it's getting a little bit difficult to justify the multiple, given the fact that sales are slowing. I will just say that since December 28th, shares of Apple are down 5 percent. It doesn't sound like so much, but in dollar right. terms for a three trillion dollar name, that's massive, and it's going to have some pretty big. It, it's well legitimately ways. statistically massive, and that it's five standard deviations from plus two to minus three. I want to point out that sell side houses have a heritage, and Piper is different than any other bank out there because they had Gene Munster iconic years ago, and to go from Gene Munster's expertise on tech over to Kumar has a certain weight that makes people either bullish or bearish on Apple lean forward and read. Agreed. And the line from them this morning, valuation concerns and broader handset and macro weakness in the first half of 2024. Apple this morning, negative by 0.68%. Under surveillance this morning, Fed officials agreeing last month that it would be appropriate to maintain a restrictive stance for some time. December's meeting minutes saying, quote, many participants remarked that an easing of financial conditions beyond what is appropriate could make it more difficult <coughs> for the committee to reach its inflation goal. Focus Amen. now turning to weekly jobless claims due out in about an hour from now and then onto the payrolls report tomorrow morning. Lisa, that was the quote that jumped out for me, for you and basically everybody else as well. 
Is that pushback from this Federal Reserve against what we've seen over the last three months? That seems to be maybe on the edges what people are talking about. Torsten Slock discussed this yesterday of Apollo, where he said, basically, you've had a dramatic easing in financial conditions, which may force the Fed to hold rates higher for longer, right. because essentially the market's already given a couple rate cuts, right? That's essentially what we've already seen. I saw several quotes that were good, a few of them worthless, and then I went to the one that John went to, where many... <laughs> What in God's name is many? Just for the record, he did actually read the minutes yesterday. We talked about it on the phone in the afternoon. I was shocked, but it happened. Let's go to the next story. <laughs> Tensions building in the Middle East after nearly 100 people were killed in a blast in Iran. Two explosions targeted a crowd marking the death of a top general killed by a U.S. drone strike back in 2020. No group. Tom is taking responsibility right. for the blast. The U.S. State Department is saying it has no reason to believe that Israel was involved. We talked to experts here, Greg Vallier, with us moments ago, making very clear it's front of mind for him this morning. Every other topic is pushed aside but what, what we witnessed in Iran. Alisa, you raised the question, to your <clears> point, <throat> kind of confusing what took place in the last 24 hours, trying to work out what was behind this? Even Iranian officials are not putting blame on anyone in particular, though implicating uh, their conflict with uh, Israel. I will just say there's been a little bit harder of a rhetoric coming from the White House recently, having to do with the Houthi militants, having to do with connections with Iran, having to do with their patience running out. And Tony Blinken is heading back to the Middle East in the next couple of days yet again for another tour to try to uh, coalesce some sort of uh, group to counter this. But it does feel like things are just simmering at a bit of a higher level. I've completely lost count of how many tours he's already done. I know, that's the what I was thinking. The amount of aggressive diplomacy, intense diplomacy we've seen led by Blinken, Secretary Blinken, over the last few months has been quite phenomenal. Your final story this morning, <coughs> this one, a showdown in Washington. Donald Trump asking the Supreme Court to overturn a ruling that would bar him from the presidential ballot in Colorado. Trump warning the Colorado decision would, quote, likely be used as a template to disenfranchise tens of millions of voters nationwide. That is according to a copy of the filing, Tom, seen by Bloomberg. Yeah, I don't know what to make of this in the sense that there are other states right now considering this and that's the important point to me so we have two states maine and colorado front and center i believe my math is that means 48 other states haven't made a decision yet where's that tip point is it two states? Is it four states? Is it 14 states? I don't know. How immune have people gotten to legal <coughs> issues involving Donald Trump? I mean, every time something comes right. up that's legal that has to do with Donald Trump, initially people were saying this <coughs> is going to be massive. And now it's sort of like, well, it'll be another fundraising opportunity and a discussion about right. what free elections are. Seriously, though, this is the reason why people aren't even looking at this, because otherwise it looks like he's poised right. to win the nomination. And now is the time of the new year where we find the one guest who knows I screwed up biggest and that is Winnie Caesar, global head of strategy at credit sites that wrote a research note that said the triple leveraged all cash fund was the single worst investment of 2023. I love your note, Winnie, on cash. Everybody was in cash and you say that was the worst investment of last year. Why? Well, it wasn't quite the worst. You could have just been in long end treasuries, which would have done a little bit worse than just being in cash. But if you were overweight cash and underweight risk, then you've seriously outperformed. We had the S&P up almost 24% last year, recouping all of those 2022 losses. U.S. high yield and leveraged loans up about 8.5% last year, even in investment, or 12.5% last year, even investment grade up 8.5% mm -hmm. last year. So cash looked great right. at 5%, but other stuff looked a lot better. Do you and credit sites predict that the trillions of cash will move this year and benefit your bond world and also the equity world? Indeed we do. We saw over a trillion flow into money market funds last year. So that is the cashing up of investors in corporate America as well. And we did see some fits and starts with some of that money market inflow actually coming into spread products including during December when we saw that massive rally driven by the Fed chair's kind of new tone on policy and a little bit of a pivot. And that drove a massive rally across risk products, including credit, including equities. And that was just a small drop in the bucket of all of the cash that is on the sidelines. So we don't even need to see you know, 100 billion of money market outflows coming into other products to have tremendous supportive ability for risk assets, including corporate credits, but kind of a slow drip as investors anticipate lower cash yields is going to be a tremendous backstop.
Winnie, you were bullish on credit last year, and that was the right call to make, particularly even lower rated credit. To start this year, it's been pretty brutal for that in addition to other risk. We've seen an increase in uh, high yield bond yields of almost half a percentage point over the past couple of days of trading sessions. Do you feel like this has some legs that we're going to see an ongoing sell off in credit after people readjust from the fervor of the last uh, three months of the year? Yeah, Lisa, I think that that's a, a great point. We had that tremendous rally in December that pulled forward a lot of what we had expected to materialize in Q1 of 2024 from a performance perspective. Now investors are looking at valuations. They see spreads are quite tight. In fact, we're almost to our year-end 2024 spread target for investment grade. We're through it for high yield. Bond yields are starting to rise again. We have a very heavy new issue supply calendar. And investors are saying, whoa, 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 maybe we don't need to go all in the first week of January. We can take our time. We can see how earnings play out. We can see how all the political consternations with debt ceiling negotiate or with budget negotiations are going to play out. And we can be a little bit more prudent in terms of allocating capital and not feeling like we have to be in it right away, given how tremendous that December rally was. Can we just talk about financial conditions, Winnie, because we've been saying that that was one of the most notable aspects of the Fed minutes yesterday, was that they suddenly seem worried about the easing in financial conditions over the past couple of weeks. How much have we seen the, uh, the environment for funding for companies really get better over the past month? So this is an interesting one because the environment from a borrowing cost perspective has improved a lot. Yields are much lower than the recent highs. So we've improved borrowing costs for U.S. investment grade by call it 50 to 150 basis points, depending on the issuer and where on the curve you are. And for the high yield market, kind of similar. We've, we've seen a tremendous decrease in borrowing costs. Now, that being said, at the same time, investors are actually demanding pretty healthy new issue concessions. So they're not just closing their eyes and buying whatever is coming to the new issue market. So there is that level of scrutiny going on currently, which would indicate that while financial conditions have gotten better from the issuer standpoint, it's not necessarily this kind of bonanza of we're just going to buy everything. Winnie, we've got to leave it there. It's good to catch up. Winnie Caesar there of Credit Sites. Happy New Year as well. I appreciate the update and the insight from you. Spreads have been wider over the last three sessions. It's worth going through it, Lisa. And they're not exactly small moves over the last three yeah. days. It's something like 40 basis points wider on high yield. Still incredibly low levels to get that at around 350, but certainly a move in the last three days. And talking about the sort of discussion around 6040 and how it's been positively correlated, spreads and benchmark yields have been also positively correlated. Yields on Treasuries have gone up. So, too, have yields, have bench, uh, so the, 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 the spread product, the extra yield over benchmark rates. That also has increased, meaning that the risk has increased to the funding picture of some of these companies. That's a massive move at a time when companies are going to have to start refinancing at some point. It's worth repeating. We've seen a major move in the other direction over the last few months. But, Tom, the risk coming into this year, the pain trade, so to speak, is that the boat has become all the way to the other side. So one-sided now, so to speak, in the last two or three months, which is why people like Jim Bianco of Bianco Research, Max Kettner of HSBC yeah. are talking up the pain trade potentially being this year one of repricing rates higher all over again. Yeah, you know, I, you know, I look at the full faith and credit debate and all that, but to Lisa's world in a way spreads have widened out against what, say, Max Kettner's talking about. I, I'm baffled by the issuance, the Joel, uh, Bloomberg Intelligence, Joel Levington. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the, the bond ownership of Apple, 4.4%. That's absurd. I mean, I didn't even know what to do with that. Well, Apple is not Walgreens, right? And this is sort of the issue right now that you're dealing oh, yeah. with. How do you deal with some of the lower rated companies? And that's why the discretion is interesting. There still are deals getting done, though. This is going to be the year where people are actually going to get deals done, even at higher borrowing costs. The year they might have to get some deals Correct. done. Correct. You know, that's the important point here. <laughs> they might have to, given the maturity wall on the horizon out there. If you are just joining us, welcome. Just to get you up to speed on some of the price action, we are firmer here by 0.1% on the S&P 500. Just a little bit higher after three days of losses. In the bond market, yield tie up by three or four basis points, 3.9517. We need to talk about some losses beyond tech. We need to talk about the airlines. American Airlines, seven-day losing streak. Lisa, some strength 
November through the bulk of December. Then some weakness really <coughs> kicking in for the airlines. And how much does this have to do with oil prices? And I say this around the margins. Yes, it's also people pushing back around the margins and domestic travel really struggling, particularly in the U.S. But it also has to do with oil prices. And you think about how much of a gift they've been given by the decline in crude last year. It's been a gift. There's no question about that. But what I see is shockingly low airfares as to the high fares of months ago. Stephen Trent, I believe, scheduled to be with Citigroup today to give us an update on it. He's got some enthusiasm, you know, as well. He's going to join us next time. Steve Trent of City on the airlines in just a moment. And coming up a little bit later, this conversation will continue on the bond market. Going into some key data about 32 minutes away. The ADP report, 15 minutes after that, you'll get jobless claims in America at about 8.30 Eastern time. From New York City this morning, good morning. Consumers may start to pull back. We had uh, tremendous spending over the holiday season, but we think that that might be the last hurrah for especially the consumers lower down in the inflation quintiles. Our research has shown that the upper quintile cannot make up the difference for the bottom four. So we think consumer starts to weaken here. And so that will pressure revenues. That was Tracy McMillan there, the head of global asset allocation strategy at Wells Fargo Investment Institute on the consumer. A weakening consumer could have a big impact on the airlines. A rough final week of the year for the sector. Shares of American falling for seven consecutive days. JetBlue down for five, Southwest for three. But Steve Trent says American Airlines, American Airlines analyst over at City, is still optimistic, writing this. Premium economy traffic flow, international momentum, and loyalty and co-branded card strength should continue to support network airline revenue. TK, that is the constructive view from Steve and the team. Mr. Trent owns a high ground on this. You do this with the, uh, the grind at Stuyvesant, then on to Pennsylvania. Then you go north into the middle of nowhere where there's no airports talk. And you go, someday at talk, I'm going to be an airline analyst. Trent darkens the door today. Good morning. Great to have you uh, with us here. What's the level of enthusiasm? You have a buy on United. You published that yesterday. People think you're nuts on this. How do you have a buy on an industry that seems so beleaguered? No, and thank you for having me, and Happy New Year to you guys. I think I have enthusiasm in spots. Uh, so when we look at what's going on in the space right now, you're really seeing a lot of uh, the economic value uh, going largely to two airlines, <coughs> Delta uh, and United, if we're talking about the United States market. Mm. Um, you can actually extend this thesis to, let's say, Air Canada north of the border, uh, and let's say further down south, Panama's Copa Airlines, uh, where international long haul is doing well. Uh, the network airlines have adapted very well to what I would characterize as the new normal. We have uh, most consumers uh, only in the office three days a week. Uh, that has resulted in a blended travel, let's say, with very good demand indicators uh, for premium economy. Uh, basic economy is a different story. Your mm -hmm. domestic is also a different story. Okay, you and I were weaned on this, and, and the answer is Robert Crandall changed the business years ago at American Airlines. He sat there and said, we're doing price discrimination on that. What our audience knows is tickets are cheaper now than they were a year ago, two years ago. How do you have a buy in the stocks if they're giving away seats again? So I think there are pieces of the space where we're not optimistic. Uh, we certainly don't have a buy on the whole group. Uh, we're far less sanguine uh, on those domestic-oriented carriers. But when one looks at the uh, supply situation now, uh, if you go back to 2019 and compare domestic capacity versus the U.S. economy, you roughly had $23 and 20 some odd cents of economic activity per available seat mile. Uh, go to 2023, we had roughly $28 of economic activity per available seat mile. Um, so uh, capacity has grown. The U.S. economy has grown more. I think the argument we're trying to make uh, is not to buy everything, but to be selective uh, in those network carriers that have very specific attributes 
such as very strong uh, loyalty and co-branded card. We think that's helped uh, these carriers to de-risk their earnings stream. International long haul uh, and this uh, very good setup in terms of their cabin offering. Um, blended travel, you know, economy well, plus, that's really been the big mover. How much would oil prices have to rise for you to get less constructive at American? Um, you know, in terms of Delta and United, those are really the two I like. I'm, uh, you know, less sanguine on the others, uh, quite frankly. I think if oil prices rise, it would really depend how they rise. Do you get an oil price rise because there's better global economic activity? I'm not necessarily perturbed by that because you have the likes of uh, Delta, Copa, uh, that can price that in uh, to uh, business travelers and higher end travelers. If we get an oil price spike that, you know, crude goes up 20 bucks a barrel overnight, that's a whole different ball game, uh, which is, I don't see anybody predicting, but if we, in that instance, for example, uh, that's actually a tough situation for the group because it's very hard to pivot, maybe unless you're Southwest Airlines, uh, and at least temporarily you have a, a large hedge position. Elisa has talked about this, the way these airlines are essentially just credit card companies now with airplanes bolted onto them. Who's absolutely nailed their loyalist program when you look across these airlines, these companies? Who's got it nailed down? Delta's uh, really, uh, I think, head and shoulders above most everybody Why else. Why is that, Steve? So if one looks at their brand, you know, they were thinking back to those, you know, terrible uh, pandemic days. They were the very last airline to finally unblock that middle seat uh, as consumers were just starting to get comfortable again with sitting next to strangers, <clears throat> even strangers wearing masks. Uh, Delta's the only major U.S. airline uh, that did not dilute its equity holders during the pandemic. No convertible debt offerings, uh, no equity offerings. No seats in their lounge. Bramo about fell off her chair there when you're talking about <laughs> well, Delta. Give us an second. anecdote <laughs> on Delta, Lisa. No, I mean, listen, let's get the smallest violin possible out. But I'm <laughs> just thinking, you know, of all of the massive lines outside the Delta lounge with people bringing their American Express card and pulling it out and saying, but I'm the real guy. I mean, how much is this really going <laughs> to diminish the people who are loyal flyers? You know what? And that's actually a, a hallmark of success right there. So if you look Is at it? the, you know, the loyalty program revenue, they did 4.1 billion uh, in 2021. They did five and a half some odd billion That's in 2022. Amazing. They're probably going to close in on 7 billion. They're going to, I think the print for 4Q is on, on January 12th or thereabouts. Um, so that trajectory and what they're doing on the co-branded card, mm -hmm. they have such a good brand. Uh, and for any large bank, they're probably the best counterparty and get very good economics on, on, on this program. Fast forward five years from now, how much of the revenue of a Delta is going to come from the card effort? Yes, I think if one looks at the pure economics of it versus just the stuff that runs through the income statement, sort of two different uh, pieces of flow there, uh, I think that you, know, you could have something conceivably five years from now uh, that's a good, you know, 10 to 15 percent higher than it is today, which on the surface doesn't sound like that big a deal. Uh, but when one thinks about what kind of margins you get on co-branded card revenue, uh, you know, versus main cabin passenger revenue, you know, the mix impact is big. Uh, you know, the de-risk of the earnings stream is, is also significant. Um, you know, so once again, I'm not constructive on any every single U.S. airline. Sure. There are two I really like, and then I'm less sanguine on most of the rest. I can tell you the loyalist programs, the actual loyalists, Tom, hate this. The people who actually fly on the planes, they hate it because they believe that if you can acquire the same status just by spending on a credit card, it's just a cheat code. It's not the same as actually being a loyalist and flying every single day on the planes. I know you're one of them. I know well, a lot of people following this program at I'm home mixed. are the same as well. I'm mixed because on one hand, it's a democratization of a very <laughs> otherwise uh, sort of gross system where some people are <laughs> preferred <laughs> and that, you know, are allowed in first and you're better and this and that. Like, it's sort of this, it's sort of a, a social experiment when you go to the airport and people start getting well, angry and start, you know, lining your, up and pushing each other. To your good point, I had a round <laughs> trip recently where there was not a single available sleep, seat in the lounge both ways. As well, Steve Tron, I've got to talk to you about the dangers that are out there. All of us were just foundationally shaken 
by what we saw at Anita in Tokyo here in the last couple of days. I think of Kai von Rumer at Cowan, your great colleague here in the aerospace and airline game, and the dangers that are out there. Kai lived it decades ago as well on an ugly flight. How safe are our runways, with all of your knowledge, all of your intake, how safe are the runways of American airports? Yeah, great question. And, and my heart goes out to you know, the, the folks over in Japan, not just for uh, uh, the, the, the plane accident, but the earthquake itself. Um, when one looks at the system in the United States, uh, we have very strict rules here. Um, very strict rules on air traffic limitations, on how many air traffic movements uh, each controller is supposed to monitor. Um, so I don't have big concerns about the safety. There are definitely uh, bottlenecks out there in terms of the supply of air traffic controllers. Um, and there are arguments that you know U.S. air traffic system to some extent is, is antiquated. Um, you know, that being said, how have uh, officials responded to it? Um, they have forced the industry to reduce air traffic movements mm -hmm. in some places. So I think that's uh, unfortunate for the consumer on some levels. Uh, but I'm happy to see them doing that in terms of, you know, safety first. Yeah. Steve, this was great to catch up. Thank you, sir. It's good to see you. Happy Thank New you. Year. You Steve too. Trend there of City. American Airlines, seven-day losing streak. It's been tough. Dream out of some life coming up next. The Fed has signaled three rate cuts in 2024, but the markets have taken that to mean six. If inflation keeps falling, they will deliver those cuts, probably starting relatively soon. We don't have absolute clarity on their reaction function. It's clear that the Fed pivot has eased financial conditions dramatically. There is some sort of realization here that maybe we overdid the easing and there could be some near-term volatility on equities. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Bramowitz, and Tom Keen on radio, on television. The narrative continues in extravaganza in this holiday lengthened work week, 8.15 ADP. John claims 15 minutes later at 8.30 we'll have a new narrative at 8.31. Yeah, claims the one to watch in about 30 minutes time. 216,000 is the estimate. So that's a little bit lower than the previous week of 2.18. There's still a big gap right now between what the market is expecting for rate cuts from the Federal Reserve and what the Federal Reserve is implying in their median dot in their forecast. The data is going to take care of that gap as the year progresses. Claims first, Tom, onto payrolls tomorrow. For those that want to know, 171, 171,000 is the median estimate in our survey going into payrolls tomorrow morning. Everybody's struggling here to find the inflation pulse of America. Drew Mattis has joined us here in a moment. That will help. But right now, John, I'm looking at Hess, Bavaria, Brandenburg, Saxony, <laughs> Baden-Württemberg. I guess so. It's German inflation is okay. out. Province by province. Regional inflation, is that what you're going through? I'm looking at the regional inflation. Uh, Tom, there's a reason, Lisa, and you know this, why people think the ECB is going to go before the Federal Reserve. It's not just about inflation, it's about the economic backdrop. We are not talking about the same GDP figures in the US as we are in the Eurozone. What you are seeing is greater weakness and the same disinflation that you're seeing in the United States, albeit uh, different in terms of the components. But this just sort of confirms that, the idea that it rose 3.8%, still above that 2% target, but uh, versus an estimate of 3.9%. Look, a lot of people questioned just how realistic it was for the Fed to cut before the ECB. Now people are rethinking that, right? To what degree does this sort of have a lasting narrative where people go back to thinking the ECB is going to have to cut first and the Fed's going to hold tight? Christine Lagarde tried to push back in the news conference going into the Christmas holidays. I say tried to push back. I'd say Chairman Powell almost encouraged the rate cut talk. I'm not sure the Fed minutes have clarified that for many other people. I think they've got their views. They're sticking with their views for 2024 and how many cuts we get until this data <coughs> really changes. But ultimately, Tom, that was the story. Chairman Powell engaged in this idea that they were approaching the point, maybe that point was now, to discuss reducing interest rates. Rates. But there is a difference between surgically reducing interest rates in line with the disinflation we've seen, maintaining a restrictive stance, doing that and starting a big rate cut and cycle and going all the way back to 2%. I'm going to go back to where a number of our guests are bringing it back from German inflation back to U.S. inflation. It's about the labor market, two different labor markets. And Lisa, without question, our guests are saying average hourly earnings in this jobs report tomorrow are critical. 
especially because they're not in line with the Fed's projections of 2% inflation. If you still see a 4% year over year, a 3.9% year over year wage increase, is that consistent with the kind of ongoing price stability that people are hoping for? It all does deal with the jobs market. And the jobs market right now is shifting, but it's shifting slowly, and that's a hard place to be. I mean, I'm going to start with the data here, John, to help you out. The euro, 109.51. The 10-year German gives me nothing here, 2.10%. I'm getting no drama out of the German inflation. It's no drama morning, Tom, so far at least. No yeah. drama. Some data that might change that in about 25 minutes, but who knows. Looking at the euro, just slightly stronger, as Tom indicated, 109.50, positive by a quarter of 1%. Yield to higher in the Treasury market by four basis points, 395.92. And equities, we've had three days of losses on the S&P and we're struggling to bounce, Tom. Stocks up on the S&P 500 by 0.06%. The heritage here is important. As we talk of, say, Neil Dudd and his optimism, truly one of the economists of the year last year, there's something about an optimistic frame of mind. Drew Mattis uh, showed that with Maury Harris for years at UBS. He holds court now as chief market strategist at MetLife Investment Management. Uh, Mr. Mattis joins us this morning. Drew, are you simply optimistic on the American economic experiment? Uh, actually, you know, we're in the camp that there'll be a recession next year. Uh, and so one of the things that I find most interesting, though, is that when I talk about recession, everyone thinks 2008 or 2020. Um, and I think for anyone who's been doing economics uh, for a while, you know, when we think recession, we're thinking more of a normal recession, a 2000 or 1990s type recession. Um, and so I wonder how many of these people in the soft landing camp are going to claim victory if we get a mild recession that's more normal rather than something that looks like 2008. What will that do to the stock market? Your hallmark is to take economics over to the investment world. MetLife, I mean, I know it's a bond portfolio, it's yield-driven analysis, actuarial assumption, but what does your analysis there mean for equities? Well, if you're expecting a recession, you're, you're probably kind of migrating or in a risk-off mode. Uh, and, and so, you know, t a time for caution. Now, that being said, uh, you know, timing's everything. And, and quite frankly, you know, people who have been risk-off because they're expecting a recession, you know, uh, have been missing out. Um, and so, you know, I, I do think, though, one of the interesting things in my mind about the employment report and the inflation dynamics that we're talking about are, you know, last month we had a big drop in the unemployment rate, inflation still at 3.2 percent, and everyone's talking about like, oh, they'll cut less. You know, that's not an environment. If the unemployment rate keeps moving lower and inflation's above three, you know, we shouldn't be talking rate cuts at all. We should be thinking about whether or not they'll have to restart uh, the rate hike cycle. Um, and so the fact that everyone has, has coalesced around this idea that inflation's moderating um, and that the movement in the unemployment rate only really is important if you're worried about a soft landing scenario, I, I think it's a little misguided. Drew, you now do. You alluded to this. Just a whole generation of investors conditioned by two massive shocks, the great financial crisis and the pandemic of 2020, and the response to those two shocks to take interest rates down to zero. Drew, with that in mind, do you think we've fully shaken off those periods? Because I'm with you. When inflation starts to come down, as you see it in the last few months, when you start to see unemployment maybe creep just a little bit higher and get closer to four, there is this urge to say, yes, rate cuts are coming back. We're going back to where we were. Do you think we've fully shaken that off in the last two years? Uh, I do. I, I think, you know, if there's one benefit to the surge in inflation we've seen, it's that it allowed us to get off the zero bound. Um, I think you're seeing that globally. It, it's going to be the one positive dynamic from the high inflation environment we've been living through. Uh, you know, wh one of the one of the, the the fascinating aspects of it all, though, is is really this dynamic of you know people who haven't experienced a normal recession, um, and it, it's trying because you know economists are trained in certain ways. We talk about a recession. We think everyone understands what we mean. Um, but instead, they're thinking back to 2008. They're thinking back to 2020. Um, and, and it's important, you know, I, I, there are some similarities. When things break in the economy, they break. So they happen fast. And so, you know, th this idea that kind of we're going to grind higher in unemployment, usually you jump higher in unemployment and then kind of stabilize around a certain newer level. Um, that's something that I think we have to watch out for. Uh, you know, the SOM rule, which, which I love, uh, if you do it by state, you know, in October, we had like six states in recession. 
In November, we actually went up to 11 states in recession, despite the fact that the national unemployment rate number went down. Now, I know there's a lot of data issues and things like that, you know, but the trend is towards kind of a, a, a broadening of the weakening. Uh, and I think that's also consistent with the idea that when you look at average weekly wages, something like a quarter of Americans saw their average weekly wage decline last month. That's not consistent with the rest of the movement in the unemployment report that we saw. If we're talking about a lot of traders who don't know how to deal with a regular recession, how is the market currently mispriced for that sort of more normal circumstance of a downturn rather than something dramatic, cataclysmic, like what we saw in 2008? Well, I, I think the, the problem is, is that they're dismissing kind of the, the normal recession and just assuming that it will be a soft landing because they don't see the signs of stress uh, that would be consistent with like a financial market recession. Um, and, and so th there's almost an overly optimistic tone because people are looking at data that m maybe is not particularly strong. Or in the, in the case I just mentioned, you know, the unemployment rate is dropping and inflation is still above three. And everyone's talking about how, how many rate cuts we're going to get next year. Uh, in any normal environment, if the, if the inflation rate was above three and the unemployment rate's dropping or continues to drop, let's say, on Friday, you know, the tone has to change from the well, Fed in that scenario. You, you can't assume, the Fed's not going to be able to assume that the unemployment rate drop is going to stop. Uh, and so then they have to worry about a tightening labor market. They have to look at that average hourly earnings numbers, which, which are not particularly great for the inflation outlook. And they have to really think about, you know, how, you know, do they have inflation contained or, you know, did they, did they get the low hanging fruit and the rest of it still to come? If that's the case, do you think that the rotation into consumer cyclicals that we saw at the end of last year and small cap stocks was misplaced and that those are going to get punished as we head toward what you say are signs of a right, more normal recession? Well, as I said, you know, if you're looking at it, if you're looking at a recession, you, you, you know, you should be thinking more in a risk off mindset, right? There's always opportunities in every asset class, no matter what the conditions are. Uh, but broadly speaking, you know, if you're expecting a recession, you're expecting an increase in unemployment, you're expecting some firms to actually fail, some defaults to occur, et cetera. You know, th that's more of a risk off environment and, and that's more consistent with, you know, uh, different asset classes. Drew, I remember you said something in the last, 10 years, maybe eight, nine years ago, when you and I were talking and you said something like, higher interest rates may actually be the solution to the low growth, low inflation story we were stuck in at the time. We've got an experiment now, we've got a case study, if you will, Drew, over the last 18 months. What are you seeing take place with that in mind? Well, so I think you're seeing a normalization of consumer behavior. Um, so, you know, one of the problems you have is that if you push the, the investing rate too low, uh, what happens is, is that people who are saving, what are they saving for? Primarily, most Americans are trying to save for retirement, right? From the time they enter the labor force to the time they leave it, they're trying to save for retirement. And if you have a zero rate uh, and, and extraordinarily low tenure yields, people actually have to save more rather than less. There's an optimal rate for everything. And, and the optimal rate for tenure, for the tenure note, in terms of s minimizing savings is about 4%. That's where you want it to be, where people actually feel incentivized to save, um, but they're also maximizing their consumption function because they feel like they're getting a good enough return that they can continue to save for retirement. Um, and, and we are seeing the experiment play out. And I, and I think, you know, you're seeing positive dynamics around the world everywhere where rates have moved off the zero bound. Uh, it, you know, it shouldn't be surprising to anyone uh, that, that that kind of uh, thing is occurring. Abnormal rates lead to abnormal responses on the part of consumers and, and other actors in the economy. Drew, thank you, buddy. Appreciate the clarity. Drew Manis there from MetLife. Happy New Year, Drew. It's good to catch up. If you are just joining us, welcome to the program. Your S&P 500 just about unchanged. We're positive here by 0.04%. We are about three minutes away from the ADP report, Tom. Then it's on to jobless claims later this hour. Long ago and far away, Drew Mattis said, guess what? Weekly claims matter because they're weekly. It is one of the few pulsing data points we get. I have trouble with it because to me it's asymmetric. It's just about claims where maybe jolts and others are more symmetric. But the bottom line is, boy, is it frequent data. And Mr. Mattis years ago said that matters. I've been a broken record this morning, probably every morning, but I'm talking no. about incremental data and the idea that we're seeing just sort of incremental shifts upward in the initial jobless claims. Yeah. So is that normalization or is this something that we should be concerned yeah. about? 
I don't know. I mean, that's a, I, and the market's my, not sure what to do with that. You, I'm glad you brought this up. We touched on it hours ago. The answer is on a probabilistic basis of 30, 40, 50 people. Guess what? Every, there's just this jumble of narratives, and we've just shifted and into the Friday. Well, McKee knows this better than we do. There's just been this shift. Who knows? I have no clue. I, have I remember. No clue. I'll say this. Base, Ian Lingen. Is I remember email. early December sitting around this table with you and saying, what's the difference between a welcome easing in the economy of the labour market and an unwelcome deterioration? And I was thinking, are we close to that inflection point where it started to become yeah. that unwelcome deterioration and then claims dropped to 203? Yeah. Claims dropped back to like 200k again. We're still right in and around those kind of levels, Tom, which historically exceptionally low, exceptionally right. low. To me, it's just an absolutely unique economy off the pandemic. And one answer is there's a new productivity out there we don't understand and we may not understand it for 10 or 20 years. Here's the next 20 we'll minutes still be around on that. Bloomberg. Stay tuned for this. Carl Riccadonna of BNP Paribas to break down the ADP report on jobless claims. Mike McKee is going to be around the table in just a moment. From New York, this is Bloomberg. The jobs report last month beat estimates. That is a stunning number. That is what nobody was expecting. The bullish train has left the station. This is what Powell does not want to see. This Friday, Tom, Jonathan, Lisa, and Mike will bring you crucial data and expert analysis at terminal speed. You're really not seeing the level of restrictiveness show up yet in the labor market. Significant job growth and high labor force participation. There's a very strong chance that the market is mispriced for 2024. The December jobs report, Friday on Bloomberg Television and Radio. The challenge here for the Fed is that they still want to have the soft landing, and we all want to have the soft landing. That would be the best outcome, of course, from so many dimensions. But what is beginning to matter is that they have now sucked so much liquidity out. We've gotten to a point where we are beginning to see some strains in the plumbing. That was Torsten Slock of Apollo looking ahead to the data. Payrolls tomorrow morning. We just got the appetizer. Mike McKee, an upside surprise on the ADP report. Yeah, who ordered the supersize? 164,000 jobs, according to ADP, were added to payrolls in the month of December. That's well above the 125,000 that had been forecast. They revised down last month's number from 103 to 101, but um, they, they don't match up very well with what was uh, the Labor Department's number last month, which was 150 for private sector jobs. So we'll see how this uh, turns out uh, in the long run. It looks like... Uh, Pay, payrolls uh, largely grew in the service providing industries, which is kind of what everybody expects. Uh, education and healthcare, 42,000, according to uh, the uh, ADP numbers. Leisure and hospitality, 59,000. And those have been the areas that have been growing uh, on a regular basis each month. They are generally lower paid, but we are seeing, according to the ADP pay growth numbers, uh, only a slight decline in annual pay change, 5.4% down from 5 0.6% for those who stay in their jobs, job changers, 8%. So uh, a stronger than expected ADP report. I'm going to go with Lisa's analysis. Uh, like, what do we do with this? I don't know. <laughs> that was basically Bramo's response to this in the commercial break. Bloomberg surveillance always a value ahead. 164 the number, 125 the estimate. Here's the price action off the back. Just a collective shrug, I think. What do we do with this? The equity market on the S&P 500, basically where it was, positive by almost 0.1%. Yields near session highs. For whatever that's worth, we're higher by, let's call it three basis points yeah. at the front end of the bond market, 435.96 on a two-year, on a 10-year. Getting closer to 4% here, Lisa, up five or six basis points, 397. It's just basically leaning into this idea that maybe the big risk factor is that the economy doesn't slow down as much as people had expected and that we don't get as much of a disinflationary force from things like a softening labor market. This sort of speaks to that, but you're right. That was my first thing. What do we do with this? Because it's sort of unclear the correlation between the ADP and non-farm payrolls. It's sort of unclear. Yes, we know service sector is hiring much more than manufacturing. Manufacturing kind of flat on its back. So, eh, okay. Yeah, uh, okay. Like, what do, I don't know. How do Economists we, how do we... on Wall Street everywhere just sort of writing that headline. <laughs> well, it's not just one. ADP's fault in the sense no, that... I'm not saying that it beca is. Because well, Mike McKee's going to defend him now, so give him a chance. Right? Uh, well, <laughs> I, I don't know how much of this is a defense, but the issue has been for people on Wall Street and for economists is how fast can job growth continue to be 
and inflation still come down. So it, there doesn't the the whole Phillips curve debate is still is still underway, and it looks like Phillips is losing at this point. So if ADB comes in strong, that doesn't necessarily mean things are bad for inflation. What's the value of claims? You were talking about Drew Mattis years ago lecturing me on the weekly value of claims. Does that still hold true? In 2024? Well, on a trend basis, it sort of does. We'll get that at 8.30, of course. And it does suggest that at this point, we're not seeing any kind of real deterioration in the labor force. The number we're going to want to watch, uh, though, is uh, for tomorrow is the claims number for the survey week, which includes the 12th, came out on the 15th, and that was 206,000, <coughs> even lower than where we are today. So it all points to a fairly strong report tomorrow. Mike McKee, stay close. Jobless claims about 10 minutes away, nine minutes away. We're looking for 216, as Mike mentioned. Payroll's coming up tomorrow morning. TK, the estimate there, 171,000, the median estimate in our survey. A three day extravaganza into two days. It's a holiday lengthened work week. Carl Riccadonna knows that, chief US economist at BNP Paribas. We're going to squeeze it in right now ADP, then claims, and then on to the jobs report. Carl, what matters among these many reports? I think what matters, uh, and first of all, Happy New Year to the surveillance team. Uh, I think what matters in the labor data is uh, kind of the, the interesting nuance in the details. And that is that I think the labor market dynamics we're grappling with at the moment, as we eye soft or soft-ish uh, landing uh, type of scenarios, is that uh, there's a real distinction here uh, between uh, rising layoffs and uh, a lack of hiring. And it seems like the latter, that lack of hiring, uh, is really what's driving the labor dynamics uh, at the moment. We saw that in the challenger layoffs data earlier today and also in the last several months. Uh, that's why jobless claims are kind of trending sideways uh, for a very uh, extended uh, period of time and not giving us a lot of uh, forecasting information for non-farm payrolls. Uh, and rather, it's just a uh, reduced appetite to add workers uh, that seems to be driving the labor market dynamics at the moment. Which is the reason why Jolt's data yesterday, in particular the quits number, was interesting because it kind of confirms that, that employees are feeling that, that they don't want to quit so quickly because it's not clear who's going to hire them on the other side. What does that signal to you in terms of whether this is an inflection point to something that's just sort of a little weaker rather than something that could accelerate more significantly with greater weakness? I think the trend in the jolts data, the quits rate in particular, openings to uh, unemployment, uh, all of this signals that there's a great normalization happening at the moment. So I don't think, Lisa, you mentioned inflection point. Uh, I don't think we're at an inflection point at the moment. In fact, if we look at the, the hiring trend, it's been a very linear trend since the start of last year. For, uh, so, so for more than 12 months now, just as very linear fit, if we look at a three, a six, a 12-month moving average on payrolls, now there is a slope to that line, and it's aiming lower. So there is a, a hissing sound in the labor market. Market. Uh, we're losing uh, altitude, uh, I think, to the tune of about 15,000 uh, uh, per month on non-farm payrolls, if we look at that kind of broad trend. Uh, but that's an extrapolation of that linear trend, so that's just more normalization. That's not getting to that inflection point uh, where things suddenly break down. That could happen in the first part of the year, but... Uh, I think that it's uh, going to be uh, a few more months uh, before we start to think about that inflection. Because after all, if we're looking at non-farm payrolls averaging in the vicinity of 150 to 200,000, uh, that's still a very healthy income and wage dynamic for the economy. So that would uh, provide a big buffer against that non-linearity uh, developing. Carl, can you help me out? Because when I got the ADP number, when we all got the ADP number, sure. I just didn't really know what to do with it. What do you do with this? Well, I think we look at the composition of ADP, uh, whether we're looking by firm size, uh, which we've really seen uh, really a concentration on kind of middle-sized firms uh, contributing to job gains over the last, uh, last several quarters, actually. Uh, that factors into the diffusion of job gains, which was something Mike McKee uh, highlighted uh, just, uh, just ahead of me. Uh, and when we look at the diffusion of job gains in the economy, this is often the canary in the coal mine, so to speak. Uh, in the diffusion of job gains, 
growth uh, last month excluded uh, has been continuing to deteriorate. So this again signals that the labor market is firing on fewer and fewer cylinders. Now there was a spike in diffusion uh, last month, but that was the end of the auto strike and tangentially related industries uh, kind of uh, getting those workers back and resuming production. Uh, but that longer term deterioration in the, in the breadth of job creation uh, is something that uh, disturbs me that uh, uh, potentially could point to the soft landing being a bit more soft-ish uh, than, than just soft. Just to build on some of that, Carl, just quickly, because we'll get claims in about five minutes. You're kind of going to sit by, stand by, and break that down for us alongside Mike McKee. Carl, is there a number on claims, a line in the sand, so to speak, where you start to get concerned? 250, 300, where things start to break out a bit? I think if we start to see kind of a 15 to 20 percent increase in initial claims relative to, let's say, the trailing quarterly average, uh, that's when I start to get nervous. Now, mind you, the claims numbers are at extremely low levels, so kind of the, you know, that, that gives you an easier path to uh, a big percentage increase. But we need to see a, a sustained pickup in claims, not around holiday weeks and, uh, the, uh, you know, the turn of the year and whatnot when there's often a pickup in volatility, yeah. uh, but on a sustained basis, you need to see that pickup. On the continuing claims, there seems to be some seasonal adjustment issues. So I treat that skeptically. Cal, stay close. We'll break it down in just a moment. Cal Ricardana of BNP Paribas. Jobless claims coming up next. Your estimate, 216,000. Following an upside surprise on ADP. Equity futures just about unchanged. From New York, this is Bloomberg. Jobless claims data just seconds away. Mike McKee around the table to break that down. Carl Riccadonna of BNP Paribas ready to respond to it. That data just seconds away with your equity market shaping up as follows on the S&P 500. Positive by almost a tenth of 1% on the S&P. Yield higher by five basis points on a 10-year 396.48. Following an upside surprise on the ADP report, 164,000, the estimate 125. Claims data. Mike McKee, there's your downside surprise. There's your downside surprise, which, you know, this is the number that is supposed to be better if it's lower. 202,000 down from 218 that was uh, the uh, the prior number without revision. Uh, continuing claims, 1,855,000 down from 1,875,000. So better news all around in the claims numbers. Now, I'm going to put in the standard economist disclaimer for this time of year that holidays distort the seasonal factors and it can be difficult to get an accurate read on where we are. But in general, you're going to say, looking at these numbers, that not much has changed in the labor market. And again, I want to point out the survey week, the week that includes the 12th of December, the number was 1875 because that was uh, last week for continuing claims. Uh, they're, they're two weeks behind. And it was 206 for uh, the headline number. So we are still seeing some uh, enormous progress here. Uh, Last week's uh, claims numbers were uh, revised up to 220, which would have gotten your attention, John, I think, if, if, if that had been the case. Exactly. And instead, yeah. we lose 18,000. It goes to 202. But remember, we had uh, New Year's Day, so maybe that. To your uh, point, it's early days. It's one data point. Let's just push it through the bond market. Yields at session highs on a 10-year, up six basis points, getting closer and closer to 4%, 398, 202. At least, so if you put this together with a strong payroll report on Friday, then it's going to speak to the Max Kentner of HSBC call, which is that the risk this year is you get a reprice in the rates again, particularly if you see more of this. And I've got no idea if you're going to see more of this, but certainly that's an early read on maybe what's to come. That's what I was going to say. Actually, this is getting interesting. ADP uh, followed by this, and now non-farm payrolls next up to see whether we see that strength, the stronger than expected labor market continue to come through. How can you price in six Fed rate cuts with uh, you know hiring at a decent pace, unemployment rates near record lows, not really showing signs of cracking, it doesn't really make sense. And this, to me, is really uh, emerging as the theme, at least of the first week of 2024. Uh, Mike McKee, is this labor market a reason to stay hawkish at the Federal Reserve? Does this lead to higher wage pressure? Well, it depends on how you define <coughs> hawkish. If, it, if you define it as the Fed doesn't cut interest rates as soon as people think, yes, it probably puts a little pressure in that area. Uh, we will not 
get another payrolls report before the next Fed meeting because it's January 31st. Oh, so uh, this is what they're going to take into the uh, right. into the meeting room. If you define it as will right. they raise rates, I still don't see that. But right. we'll see what happens maybe with that average hourly earnings and, of course, CPI next week. Let's get up front of Carl Ruckadon. i got a bigger, broader question for him. Let's go narrow tomorrow. How do you interpret average hourly earnings within the 47 other measurements of wage growth that are out there? Well, average hourly earnings are telling us that uh, we are not there yet uh, in terms of uh, the Fed being able to declare mission accomplished. Uh, average hourly earnings running at 4% are still too hot uh, for inflation to be sustainably uh, at uh, right. a 2% run rate, especially as we look at the core numbers. Uh, and even more important than average hourly earnings is the employment cost index wage and salary component. Uh, that's running at 4.6. It needs to be at 3% or less right. uh, to be consistent with 2% uh, uh, core PC inflation. So we are simply, you know, there, there's lots of good progress. The glide path is uh, uh, looking in the right direction, uh, but there is still uh, uh, further room to run before we can feel more comfortable. Carl, I've got to go to 60,000 feet here. You're really good at this. Peter Drucker, 1991, on the new productivity. Do we have any clue, given our labor data that we're in right now, what the productivity, the efficiency, the efficacy of our labor is? I would suggest we're flying blind. I think we are still flying blind uh, post-pandemic, Tom, and we've seen some wild swings in productivity productivity due to labor shortages and then the rebound in participation. Uh, lo lots of uh, uh, kind of wild swing factors are really distorting the numbers. That uh, big surge we saw uh, in GDP growth in Q3, of course, distorts productivity. Uh, that's not the beginning of a trend. That was a one-time flash in the pan. Uh, we can see that in the tracking forecasts uh, for Q4. Uh, so there really is still a lot of instability and noise uh, that we have to look through to get a, a clearer perspective. Now, uh, what I think does give us some sense of the trend uh, when we have extended periods of labor scarcity uh, and high labor costs uh, typically that pushes businesses encourages them to make the kind of uh, productivity enhancing capital investments uh, that do lead to a productivity boom uh, but we're you know we're, we're, we're still uh, not out of the woods yet uh, the labor data does look to be uh, moving to a more balanced uh, state where maybe we have less uh, labor cost pressure uh, six months from now for example uh, and then that would say maybe there'll be less of a productivity flare-up than we might be anticipating. Of course, AI is a big wild card, but I think it's a little bit too soon uh, to be factoring that into the macroeconomic data uh, on, on that kind of scale. If you are just joining the program, we did just get a one-two punch, better-than-expected jobs data with the ADP report coming in hotter than expected, and then initial jobless claims coming in lower than expected. You could see an extension in the move with 10-year yields now creeping closer to that 4%, 3.99% percent if you round up uh, about uh, just a less than one basis point. Carl, how much are you looking at a market that is screaming that we are not going to have any recession anytime soon without some sort of exogenous shock? Well, I think the market signal is very important, but uh, that market signal will be very subject to the macroeconomic data trend. And we are certainly moving to a slower pace of activity than where we were, uh, for instance, in Q3 of last year. So it is a, a slower profile in the first part of this year, which will mean less hiring. Uh, that puts pressure on margins and, uh, and revenue gains and whatnot. If there's slower nominal GDP, then those things uh, tend to slow down uh, as well. Uh, so it'll be a challenging macro environment, which will be uh, an environment in the first half of this year where the macro variables really do drive the narrative as we'll get some clarity on whether it's a bumpy landing, soft landing, no landing, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and so uh, I think we do have to you know, pay very c careful attention to that tug of war between what markets are seeing in terms of Fed easing and whatnot uh, and what the macro data are, are suggesting. Are you and as we look at the claims numbers, right, this is consistent uh, with what we said ahead of the data, which is it's not layoffs that are uh, cooling the labor market at the moment. Uh, it's just a reduced appetite for hiring. You mentioned the market signal, Carl, and I think that really follows di nicely onto what we saw yesterday in the meeting minutes. Jay 
Powell kind of dismissed this idea of financial conditions in the December FOMC meeting. And then he inserted that back in, at, or somebody did, in the meeting minutes where suddenly they're worried about this easing in financial conditions. Do you think that basically the, it, the implied rate cuts that we have seen priced into the market through the end of last year have made it more difficult to really achieve that price stability in a way that we see with ongoing labor market strength? I think that the easing of financial conditions, which is pretty substantial, our own BMP financial conditions index uh, would say that uh, you know the moves from the highs are equivalent to maybe 100 basis points of Fed cuts. Uh, that complicates the uh, exit process. Now the Fed knows full well that when they shift from uh, you know the risk of uh, there being more hikes to uh, either being on perma hold or moving to a lower uh, policy rate, that there's always going to be that kind of easing of financial conditions uh, that takes place. But absolutely, this does complicate the process. We heard that in the minutes, uh, the line that said, you know, the easing of financial conditions, you know, the scope or the magnitude of it uh, could jeopardize the Fed's uh, path. If we have a, a real reacceleration in the economy, then that, that last mile in the inflation fight uh, becomes uh, more difficult and that's going to slow down uh, the Fed in that process. What I thought was interesting uh, in the minutes was the, uh, you know, the, usually the Fed has the boilerplate language. If it's hotter, we'll go higher. If it's uh, cooler, we'll go lower. Uh, and, and they didn't do that. It was, I think, on page eight of the minutes uh, where they talked about, uh, you know, kind of maybe empty or somewhat empty rhetoric about saying that, you know, there's a possibility of more hikes. Uh, then they went on to say there's a possibility that we could take longer to pivot towards cuts. Um, but they never then added the other side of the scale, which is, and if things are cooler, we could go sooner. Um, so that tells you they're very sensitive to yeah. the market reaction uh, to the December press conference. Carl, the fact that we were all wrong last year and that we got this wonderfully buoyant economy and right now, uh, John, a 3.8% statistic on the unemployment rate guesstimate for tomorrow. Carl, are we fully employed? I mean, there's a lot of Americans flat on their back. But are we fully employed in America? As we look at the aggregate data, right, the unemployment rate below 4%, uh, if we look at the wage trends, uh, I think it's pretty uh, apparent that, uh, that we have been in a period of full employment uh, and, and that uh, largely explains those wage pressures. Now the labor market is cooling, so uh, while, while we may be fully employed uh, now on the eve of the uh, December jobs report, uh, by the middle of the year or later, uh, I think that uh, there could be uh, you know, a, a, a hotter debate about whether we still are uh, at full employment because we will see those wage pressures coming down as the unemployment rate drifts higher. Uh, and uh, that will create some slack, which is a welcome development after the last uh, uh, last two years uh, post-pandemic environment uh, to uh, get us that last mile back to 2%. Uh, of course, full employment is very important, but as uh, Jerome Powell reminds us uh, in nearly every press conference, right, price stability is the bedrock or the foundation of a, a stable economy. So it, you know, we can't just push the unemployment rate as uh, low as we can go uh, without uh, taking into consideration that trade-off uh, with, uh, uh, with the inflation dynamics. And that was actually something that was uh, uh, highlighted in the minutes yesterday as well, where now policymakers are starting to think about the trade-off on the dual mandate. Uh, you know, so there, there's more weighting to both factors on the, on the, on the dual mandate uh, relative to where we were over the last uh, several quarters. Hey, Carl, just quickly, just to recap, expectations tomorrow. What are the numbers for you and the team? Well, I'm eyeing this uh, hissing sound in the labor market. We're gradually losing momentum. So I think 165-ish mm -hmm. uh, on the number, which now turns out to be just slightly below uh, the consensus forecast. And I would watch for uh, some slack in the, in the unemployment rate. I actually think uh, maybe a two-tenths increase up to 3.9%, mm -hmm. uh, with still those persistent wage pressures in the background. Keep in mind, inflation is a lagging indicator and so is labor inflation. Carl Riccadonna, appreciate it. Happy New Year, sir. Carl Riccadonna of BNP Paribas. One eye on this one, the 10 year, really close to 4%. High of the session, 399.50. Right now, about 399.30 off the back of the upside surprise on ADP and the right kind of downside surprise on jobless claims just moments ago. Bramo 202 on claims going into payrolls tomorrow morning. All right, if we can coin a narrative for 2024, just based on the price action of a couple days of 2024, it would be that people got a little over their skis in terms of the potential disinflation and the weakness in the economy. The ongoing strength in the U.S. economy and labor market has been remarkable, and we get that again today in the economic data. If you are just tuning us, joining us, the S&P 500 turning negative off the back of some of this. We're down by 0.1% 
percent on the S&P 500. That follows three days of losses on the S&P, four days of losses on the Nasdaq 100. And I want to return to the quote that we got from Max Kettner of HSBC published yesterday. We continue to believe that from a multi-asset perspective, the biggest risk is not from a sudden deterioration in earnings or activity, but another repricing in rates. And TK, as we start, commence a brand new trading year and start 2024. We're very, yeah. very close to that repricing right now. Yeah, I think the repricing's happened quickly. And again, in Apple, we saw it across five standard deviations, plus two to minus three. Pushing back against a lot of the caution out there, Gina Martin Adams of Bloomberg Intelligence on equities was blistering yesterday over the guesstimates, the certitude that earnings will come in short. And she said the fact is in the cycle where we are, you do get out the high single-digit, double-digit earnings growth. I'm not hearing enough about that right now. Mike McKee, got about 45 seconds. Final word on the data. Uh, suggests that we are at least in status quo, which for the last couple of months has been very good news for the overall economy because we're not seeing inflation rise, but we are seeing employment still stay strong. And that's what the Fed and the soft landing people want to see. The payrolls report tomorrow morning, 8.30 Eastern time. The estimate in our survey currently 171,000. The data so far, so far so good on the ADP report and on jobless claims as well. Coming up on this program, you can't say the same thing about the auto sector in this country right now for GM or for Ford. The latest with Bloomberg's David Welch on the auto industry up next. Beyond BYD, beyond Tesla, how much of a reality check are we getting for the industry, for the likes of GM and Ford? I think a big reality check. That's why you've seen Farley, I think Mary, they pull back, you know, in terms of a bit from the EV strategy in Detroit. And, and, and the problem here is, do, do consumers want EV or they just want a Tesla? No doubt there's been, I think, much more moderate demand that we're seeing across the board that right there is the question, a question we've all been asking over the last several quarters. Do consumers want EVs or do they just want a Tesla? Much more important question here in America we'll get to in just a moment. Here's the broader price action. A lot to recap in the equity market on the S&P 500 as we go towards the open and bow in about 43 minutes time. Equity is just turning negative on the S&P. So we've had three days of losses on the S&P 500. Meanwhile, <coughs> Mao add to it off the back of some data in America in the last 50 minutes or so. Upside surprise on the ADP report, 164, estimate 125. The right kind of downside surprise on jobless claims, 202, the estimate 216. And here we are on a 10-year yield, very, very close to 4% again. Up Lisa by almost eight basis points on a session to 399. The macro signals right now are that the U.S. economy is doing really well, uh, or at least staying on trend. And we're not necessarily getting any kind of inflection point, as we were just hearing from Karo Kadana. What I find interesting is some of the micro stories and the competitive advantage that certain companies are having. I just want to take a look at this. Yesterday, uh, Bloomberg reported that TikTok is eyeing a $17.5 billion shopping business on Amazon's turf and how they're going to really uh, build that out in the U.S. You can see Amazon shares down this morning. Also, TikTok working with Peloton, a U.S. company, to roll out some initiative. And the Peloton shares are up more than 7%. This is just the interesting dance. And it has geopolitical consequences. And it has all sorts of competitive consequences, which really feed into the auto industry as well. Who gets wait, wait, the upper wait, hand at what, this time? If I'm on the Peloton bike in the living room or in the back bedroom, <laughs> that has yeah, geopolitical sure. consequences. It does, actually, because okay. if you think about it, well, you're going to They're going to feed you communist Serious. propaganda through the Peloton. <laughs> no. Is that what you happens? Know, there have been studies you're riding actually, there and you get fed right, communist propaganda from I, the CCP. I, look, <laughs> the question, the hold on. There are questions about whether you want TikTok uh, really careful, having John, as much of an inroad going, in you know. the U.S. And you have all sorts of politicians talking about that. Meanwhile, they're going to start to try to dominate the Amazon uh, industry of online uh, shipping, and you have, you know, coming into your bedroom to tell Tom how to work out. <laughs> that has geopolitical <laughs> Try to consequences. Try it out beyond five minutes. That's the advice <laughs> from Beijing. And we're all very excited about this now, Tom. Man, yeah, we're really, all ramped up. Saving through. us <laughs> in Michigan, in Dearborn, in Detroit, is David Welch, our Bloomberg Detroit Bureau Chief, who's going, I signed up for this this morning. David, I want to look at the gross business here. Under 16 million unit sales this year. I guess it was a pretty good year. 
I go to the screen and I basically got the typical small foreign car, $28,000. I look at some kind of fancier US car, $10,000 more. How does price play into the auto business in 2024? Right now, it's everything. You've got high interest rates. You still have pretty, even though sticker prices have come down, the average vehicle's around $48,000. That's very expensive. That, that means you've got payments well over 700 a month, which means that you've got, uh, you know, th these are affluent people buying new cars right now. It, right. It, it's not really a thing for the poor, certainly, and even middle class people struggle uh, to buy right. one. We did see some big gains in the quarter, things like Nissan Sentra. Nissan Kicks uh, went up pretty nicely. GM's done pretty well with the new Chevy Trax. These are vehicles that sell in the 20000 know, twenty to $30,000 range. But th those are pretty affordable uh, for people. Right. And, and, and so w the companies playing down in that range can get some buyers because yeah. th those, there, there aren't that many affordable D vehicles. David, let me go back to first principles. My first interview with Bloomberg ever was a guy named Rick Wagoner who ran a small auto company in Detroit. I'm gonna ask you the same question I asked him decades ago. It's just real simple. Why can't we build a cheaper car to compete with the rest of the world? You know, the companies can. I, I think they've just gotten away from it because the profits aren't there. Uh, they have to, you take the, the Chevy tracks. I, I give GM a bit of credit here because they really have tried to come up with a vehicle that can sell for a little over $20,000 and appeal to that entry-level buyer. But they build it in Korea. They don't build it in the U.S. Uh, you know, the other automakers will, will build those vehicles in Mexico. The profit margins on those vehicles are so thin that you do need to you know, shave every bit of parts and labor savings that you can in order to try to make a buck on them. And often they're basically just vehicles to get people into your brands hoping that they'll have a good experience and graduate on to something bigger, pricier, and more profitable later on. David, let's ask the question that Dan Ives asked himself just yesterday. Do consumers want EVs or do they just want a Tesla? What's the answer to that at the moment? Well, look, your third quarter EV sales in the U.S. were up 50% year over year. Tesla's wow. EV sales were not up 50%. So that means somebody's getting... Uh, the, the above 30 whatever percent it was, I think that Tesla grew in the quarter with its total sales. So yeah, they do want other people's EVs. Uh, the numbers aren't very big right now, and that's why the growth rates are higher. So the problem is the other people's, the other companies' EVs are things like $80,000 F-150 Lightnings and $60,000 Cadillacs, and, and and they're just and you know, Hyundai and Kia do pretty well with them, but they're not cheap vehicles either. Prices are still too high for the non-Tesla EVs. And the, 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 the charging network is still not there. Getting better, the deal with Tesla where everyone's going to be able to piggyback and use their charging network will certainly help. And the investment by seven automakers to build out a network also will. But none of that's really you know, taking hold and in place yet, as it does happen over 2024. Uh, people will see more charging stations and maybe have confidence to buy. But it's look, it's still price, variety, and charging network are holding back the mass market buyer from going electric. How many of these cars are still eligible for tax credits? David, you alluded to some of that. You talked about the pricing strategy. How have things changed to start the new year? Yeah, look, that's, that's shrinking down to I think it was 13 was the tally. Uh, some of the companies are, are trying to resource key parts to get them eligible. GM said that the Cadillac Lyric and uh, the Chevy Blazer, their midsize SUVs or crossover SUVs, both electrics, they should be able to get those qualified in, in, in the first quarter sometime by resourcing two parts for those vehicles that, are, that, that would get them under the, uh, the, the qualifications. And you'll see some of that, but it, look, it's not gonna be this, this you know, raining dollars from the federal government, I think, that, that a lot of people thought. Companies are gonna have to work to get that money for their buyers. David, if BYD were able to sell their vehicles in the United States at cost without having to pay massive tariffs, how much cheaper would they be than the average electric vehicle in the U.S.? Yeah, it's tough to say because you know, one of the reasons the Chinese companies aren't selling their vehicles in the U.S. right now is they're not homologated. In other words, they haven't met the safety regulations. You have to crash a bunch of cars and do a lot of testing, and you have to do emissions testing and that sort of thing. And I'm not sure if BYD's vehicles meet that. Once you do, it does add some cost. And you also, you know, your vehicles have to be roomy. They have to have all the qualifications that American buyers want, that would add some cost. They would still be pretty cheap. BYD has a great cost advantage, don't get me wrong. It's just, it's not the flick of the switch that a lot of people are thinking. But I, I do think sans tariffs, 
they'd be extremely competitive and it would be pretty scary for the domestic and, and the, the Japanese and Korean automakers doing business here. I wonder how much the price is really what defines whether or not people are buying or not buying right now. Ironically, the more expensive vehicles might have a bigger audience because they'll be the wealthier people who could pay all in cash. How much has the non-cash buyer base for autos absolutely disappeared in the face of uh, interest rates or borrowing costs that are north of 10 percent? They haven't disappeared, but it is tougher. And one thing we've seen is, is leasing is taking up, and that's a way of getting that monthly payment down, even in the face of higher interest rates. So that's one way to handle that. Uh, people are probably putting more cash down. The used car market's still pretty strong, so the trade-in's giving you people a, a, a decent, and I mean historically strong. It has weakened, but you're still getting historically good prices for you car, used car. That's good currency to go trade in a vehicle and buy something. But I, I think one of the reasons that we're seeing a 15.4 or 15.5 million unit market in the U.S. instead of the old days of 1617 is because of pricing and cost and only the affluent buyers can really afford that and you know what's, what's keeping yep. the U.S. market aloft is the rich are always with us but the middle class and poor are having a tougher time. Here's the, the inside of the day. True. David thank you sir. David Welch there out of Detroit mm -hmm. on EVs. Let's put a bow on the morning. We need to talk about the data out of America. Two small data points. It's early days. But Lisa, is it the recipe, the early sign of just the drip, 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 the water torture for bond market bulls if you get more of the same? claims, ADP, onto payrolls tomorrow. That seems to be what the market is set up for, given what the trading was in the last couple of months of last year. What happens if people start to question all of those rate cuts that they priced in, not because of Fed pushback, but just simply because the data is inconsistent with that kind of view? I look at Atlantic GDP, Atlanta GDP, 2.5%, growing America, mint claims, 3.8% unemployment. It's morning in America. How Good morning. Good morning. In America. Good morning. 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 From New York City this morning. Good morning. <laughs>